If you've seen the other parts, you get bragging rights in the comments. But if you haven't, go watch them right now. And don't forget to join my membership program for the real bragging rights. Just click the join button down below. Okay. I think we've had enough legacy matchups on the show. I mean, yeah, we're still gonna have Marvel, DC, Dragon Ball, y you know, the usual stuff. But what if I told you that we're gonna start getting experimental again? You know, like what we used to in the first two seasons. What do I mean by that? Well, you're about to find out. Despite not having a season theme to it, contrary to popular belief, Season 9 is probably the only season to be placed on a similar pedestal to that of Seasons 5 and 8. Albeit, it's less praised for having any massive high points, as much as it's praised for its consistency. Although it absolutely still has its high points, and its low points are surprisingly minimal. Mostly. But to me at least, I've always felt that this season brought me back to the classic era of death battle in many ways. While there are very few video game characters and none of the fights are longer than 4 minutes, everything else has the experimental feel of Season 2 and, to a very rough extent, Season 3. Creative storytelling in the animations, experimental styles and visuals, and the big thing, the most amount of new series debuts since Season 2. In fact, if you look at how many they introduced, it's higher than both Season 7 and 8 combined. And in general, this season feels like it has way less focus on doing what's popular and what would get views, and more on trying new things and making the viewer enjoy the ride above all else. I mean, just take a look at the season premiere and you'll see what I mean. Am I the only person who thinks it's really bizarre that it took Death Battle this long to get League of Legends on the show? I mean, I know that Arcane's popularity made it happen, but you're telling me that there was no other way to have them tackle the biggest eSport game of all time? We live in a society. Please don't say that again. And to kick things off, despite being one of my least favorite DC characters that Death Battle has used, Harley's analysis was a lot better than I remember it being. I mean, sure, it still doesn't have that many good jokes, although it's always nice to see Boomstick and Ringmaster on screen together. But her background has some really fun visual gags, with one of them having Deadpool's name being crossed out. And side note, he's my editor, so I'm sure he's gonna love this. <laughs> And in terms of story, it was excellent. It feels like this rundown alone nuances her character better than half of an entire season's worth of combatants. It starts off by saying she never fit anywhere, and then describing how she was a villain like the Joker and Ivy, and then how she rebuilt herself as an anti-hero, and then how she became a superhero. On top of how they cover her history with the Joker in its near entirety, going over her original reason for helping him out, dissecting the abuse she suffered, explaining how she got over it, and even Boomstick making a little remark about how she teamed up with the Joker a few times after all of that. I mean, that is just comics, so what can you do? They even build up her relationship with Batman and the Bat Family, beginning with how adversarial she'd been to him, saying that she can keep up with him in terms of combat skill and athleticism, and then going over how she helped Jason Todd with his trauma and became an extended member of the Bat Family. It's all paced so well that feels like they just covered a fully fleshed out character arc. I think that the only issue I have is that a couple of the panels look fairly out of place. Like, the abilities and feats tabs are shown while they're talking about her story, and then they aren't followed up on until after the panels disappear. Hell, her toxins aren't even mentioned until a minute after the panel goes away, and most of Harley's feats don't even get acknowledged until minutes before they show her feats panel, and no other ones get talked about when they show that panel. It's kind of odd. And as for Jinx's analysis, I do think it has more issue than Harley's. Like, I don't like how they have Boomstick pretend to not know about Jinx and Vi being related, only to make it out to be a twist that's more shocking than it actually is. I just feel like Boomstick wouldn't try and play this completely straight. And then there's this one other part that people watch and can't help but feel the need to say, that was an ad. And okay, I can kind of see it. But I've always felt that it's supposed to call attention to the night and day differences 
between learning about the lore of League of Legends and actually playing League of Legends. And as something of a former player myself, yeah, I can confirm this is true. But I think it would have worked better if they shortened the game's description or even just removed the sentence about the game and the salty gamer tears entirely. Otherwise, I like the banter that Boomstick and Ringmaster have. How about we move on to Arcane before I A-RAM my foot up your ass? A-RAM is a separate mode with only one lane and random champions, implying that Boomstick would rather play something luck-based than the default gameplay of League. <laughs> Burn. The rest of Jinx's analysis was still alright. They do their best to add some parallels to Harley's backstory by mixing in Arcane and the comics, although I don't think this is compositing because if I remember correctly, they're in the same continuity. And I still think the cutaways ties in with the Versus stuff naturally, and it doesn't ruin the flow of the video. And I also like how Wiz is absolutely bored by it with how he wants to phase out of the conversation. Though it is kind of lame that there are no end clips anymore, but understandable given what happened with Saitama versus Popeye. Though I do appreciate them trying to change up the the flow now that they get more sponsors per death battle episode. Albeit I wouldn't praise it here, but eventually they start doing the flow of analysis, add, analysis, add, combatants are set, fight, conclusion. Now onto the fight, and I've seen a lot more popularity go to this episode recently. The general view of this episode was the same one I've had for the longest time, where it's good, but not too special. And I was skeptical when so many people suddenly started changing their minds and calling it one of the best of the season, and among the best premieres of the entire show, when I didn't even call it my fifth favorite season premiere. And there were two big reasons why I said that. The models, and the voices. I think Harley's custom model looks great, being a nice combination of her classic design with her Suicide Squad hair but I was always kind of weirded out by how it wasn't as detailed as Jinx's model. But after re-watching the fight, the issue didn't seem to bother me anymore. Obviously more detail would be nice, but they're not usually on screen together for that long. Also, the expression work and character animations are really good, but I'll get to that later, as I still stand that the voices are problematic for me. And it's not that it's bad voice acting or anything. Felicia Valenti and Elsie Lovelock sound on point, but my issue is that the voices are just almost the exact same, and it's especially bad with Jinx's voice, because in League, her voice has a more gruff and cynical edge to it, like you'd expect a senile punk girl to have. Stay still! I'm trying to shoot you! <laughs> You're starting to bore me. And those are clearly not the inflections Jinx has in this episode. Stay still! I'm trying to shoot you! <laughs> well, that's unfortunate. Oh, and a side note, that's my least favorite part of the episode, where Jinx literally stops everything to say one of her lines from the game. That's one of the times where references don't work for me. Of course, this is another case where she may not sound like Jinx, but she acts like Jinx. But that's not my issue. My issue is that Harley and Jinx sound way too similar to one another. Where they have like the near exact same pitch to me. But aside from that, yeah, I can confidently say this is better than I remember. I really adore the carnival setting, as it makes for a bunch of fun set pieces, like the carousel and its horses making the chase scene engaging and humorous with how it feels like a full on obstacle course. And there's also the roller coaster, where its use is not as elaborate, but it does make for a fun use of Jinx's teleporter. And then there's the mirror maze, which um, I think I'll save for last. And as for the banter between the two, my issues with the voice acting aside, their dialogue shows that they're having a black. No. Don't, don't say that. I literally told myself not to say that in the script. What is wrong with me? They both sound like they're having a really good time. The voice actresses are definitely talented enough to portray their craziness differently. Harley's is more eccentric yet controlled. Moments like her skipping across the carnival games, twirling her hammer, spinning around with it as opposed to swinging it normally, and playing games on Jinx's teleporter. With Jinx, however, it's portrayed in a way that feels more erratic. Not off the wall bonkers, but it's as if she could snap at any moment. I mean, the set of it literally Jinx shooting rockets at some random birds just because they were being slightly annoying. And it's also represented with moments like Jinx's nonchalant response to Harley asking if she has a light, which was originally much more insane according to the teaser, so I'm glad that they changed it for the episode, as it makes the exchange funnier. And there's also Jinx showing no concern for a stick of dynamite being stuck in her mouth and choosing not to get herself untied from ribbons and just hopping around with it. And <laughs> she's still physically stronger than Harley. <laughs> And I think my second favorite part of the episode is the Fishbones exchange. The Fishbones voice is on point with how she does it in League. You might inconvenience people and hurt their feelings. Look out! She's right behind you! Aw, thanks pal! And then after Harley calls him a traitor, Fishbones dips his head in sorrow. <laughs> and you can actually tell the difference between the emotion despite having no face. <laughs> 
Can you tell I'm having so much fun with this? And as for the character animation, you have moments like Harley demonstrating her sick gymnastic skills with this acrobatic parkour. Seriously, this looks so smooth. Major props to the Blender team. And like I said earlier, her movements are way more controlled in comparison to Jinx, but in a way where it doesn't contradict Jinx's superior speed. So it's more in the context of the fluidity of Harley's less conventional movements rather than actual speed. But Jinx is still able to outpace Harley in moments like this teleporter shot and the pop gun dynamite scene. But then we get to the best part of the episode, the Bando Glass Mirror Maze. I see you! I see you! Remember when I said that Jinx came across as if she could snap at any moment? Well... Ugh, smells like... There's a lot to unpack here. There's the constantly increasing heartbeats, Joker's laugh in the background, the hand-drawn effects, which not only feature Vi, several times actually, but also a couple of references to Jinx's skin variants. And when Jinx punches the mirror, it features this shot of Harley looming above Jinx as if she's just about to finish her off, complete with these after images that look as if she's running around really fast, but the animators cheated a bit. It's a lot like the spring Wario scene from Wario vs. DDD, where they're really just looping the same animation back and forth but they do it at such a fast interval that it creates the illusion that she is indeed running around Jinx at such insane speeds. But then there's this insanely good exchange between the two. Jinx drops this line from League of Legends, and then Harley instantly does a psychoanalysis, and apparently this is supposed to be a reference to Joker, saying that Jinx isn't the same level of crazy as Joker, which could mean that she's able to handle it much better. But then Jinx catches Harley's bat, activates the Quicksilver Sash, and tells her, yes, I'm crazy, crazy enough to shoot a minigun into your feather-stuffed bloodstream? Uh, okay. And then her last words are a callback to Joker versus Sweet Tooth, but with two two complete differences. When Joker said this line, he had a more ominous energy to it, whereas with Harley, her master plan in the mirror maze was foiled. It comes across as if she's going for one last desperate attempt to win, but Jinx is like, nah. And I also like this selfie pose as Harley's head lands on the hammer game and rings the bell. Also, hey, DC finally lost to a character not from Marvel, woohoo! Although surprisingly, there weren't that many people celebrating it. I mean, it could be because the matchup wasn't that debatable. Maybe it's because it involved one of DC's street tiers instead of one of their heralds. Or, the most likely option, maybe DC's wins on the show were never as big of a deal as what some people randomly felt like making them out to be. And also, hot take of the night, even if Ben 10 and Archie Sonic won their fights, nobody would have cared. But that's just me. Don't just stand there, Jinx! You just want a free teddy bear! What if it's Timbers? Okay, to me at least the reference is super obvious, but I just want to point out that the storyboards originally had Harley picking a teddy bear instead of a stuffed bunny. So I like to think that Jinx just won the original prize from the storyboards, and if the bear model was gonna look like Tibbers, that would be a big brain play. The one thing worth noting about the conclusion is that it brings back the advantages and disadvantages last seen in season one. Although technically it appeared in Wolverine vs. Raiden, but shh. Yeah, it's super bare bones, only going over the basics of the matchup, but they got better later on, so I don't want to spoil their thunder. Plus, if nothing else, it's better than an episode not having them. Cough, 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 cough. But all in all, yeah, I had a lot more fun with it on a revisit, so much so that it went from not even being in my top five favorite season premieres to being my second favorite season premiere of the show. I consider it to be better than He-Man vs. lion Miles vs. Static, and Yoda vs. King Mickey! Okay, that is a real surprise. I don't think it's in the same ballpark as Dante vs. Bayonetta, but I'd be lying if I said this wasn't close. Honestly, if the voice pitches were more distinct, this probably would be in the same tier and possibly even my favorite season premiere. 90 out of 100. Kind of surprised that the edgy teenager still stuck inside of me didn't immediately vibe with this episode on its release, but then again, I am ranking it similarly to how other people would rank it, so yeah. Multiverse of Madness is a good movie, and I'm tired of being gaslit into thinking it's not. Anyways, anyone who wants to say that the season had a theme of introducing new franchises, tell me why this one has two Marvel vs. DC fights. But I mean, I don't have that much to say about this matchup. I mean, I think Wanda's alright, and Zatanna seems really cool, even if I'm not too familiar with her. But the analyses actually have something very interesting to talk about. And you can see that with Wanda's analysis alone. Previous episodes with the scale that Marvel and DC heralds can go to haven't done the best job of living up to the immense power that these characters can possess. And given that Wanda is arguably the strongest Marvel character, or at least among them, barring the obvious tiers like the Beyonder for instance, it'd be even more egregious.
egregious if that was the case here. But in the context of being an analysis primarily focused on a character's power sets, this leads into an interesting conundrum because what happens if your power set is only limited by an entire series' cosmology? And how is that going to look on a show where they have historically been afraid of going all the way with judging characters that have a multiversal level of power? Well, that's where Wanda's analysis comes in. You have this opening spiel about a woman containing every iota of reality, mentioning every star, galaxy, universe even. But once they reach the stats, BAM! Direct statements that say she can annihilate all of creation. Which makes more sense to casuals than all of existence. At least in terms of multiversal destruction. Because when you mention creation, I'm pretty sure people would at least be aware that it could potentially involve a multiverse. And not to mention that this is consistent with how they've scaled her in the analysis. No scaling, no hypotheticals, no low-end feats. Only direct statements of her omniversal power explained in a way that a non-versa debater would understand. And I'm sure people who are not into the Versa debating stuff wouldn't care about this, but if you're like me where you have enough knowledge about this, we're never gonna escape this tarpet, are we? It makes for a really interesting analysis that in a way makes me shudder in fear over what kind of character Death Battle is talking about. Plus, I do think it has other things to enjoy about the analysis, like how they covered her story, for instance. They talk about her convoluted relationship with Magneto and her brother Pietro, her admission to the Avengers, the House of M, all of it is here and thoroughly explained without taking away from the Versa side of things. Plus, it has some decent jokes, with my favorite being Boomstick casually mentioning that he's related to a Lovecraftian horror. Oh yeah, and Jocelyn appears to explain more complex stuff. I think she's utilized really well, covering the more complex aspects of Marvel Comics and Wanda's story. I personally think this is the best way to utilize her just because of the existence of Desk of Death Battle. And overall, this is one of the meteor analyses of the season, if not the show, despite being as long as the average one. Great job, Liam. You finally found the perfect balance between story and versus stats, and you kept the train going once you got to Zatanna's analysis, which feels like a direct contrast, where instead of portraying her as a cosmic horror like they did for Wanda, they portray her as an entertainer who can do anything. Like, there's lots of fun trivia specifically about her father Zatara, where he's built up as a living legend and makes the part about his deaths, plural apparently, and how she feels as if she can never live up to his prestige all the more impactful. And as for Versa stuff, not only do they say omniversal, but also immeasurable. And it's in reference to speed. And Jocelyn is still here to help elaborate on Zatanna's power as well, making this omniversal power approachable for people not in diversity debates. While I do think Wanda's analysis was a little better about this, I wouldn't be surprised if people preferred Zatanna's analysis. I prefer to be up good, thank you very much. And then we get into the fight, and sadly there's not a lot to talk about. Not because it's bad, it's just I don't have nearly as much to say. I mean, I like how Wanda is demonstrating how much of a two-bit sorcerer she is, like when she uses Zatanna's chains against her and destroys the bunnies that want to use her face as a keyhole, but then she starts getting surprised after they turn into cards. Maybe if she's dumbfounded rather than surprised I could see it, but at least it leads into the funny Superman punch. <laughs> And I think it's neat how the fight has a constant showing of differences in personalities, you know, with how Scarlet demonstrates her power and Zatanna is just trying to put on a show. Which is also showcased with Wanda's abilities being highlighted in red, and Zatanna using as many zany and whimsical spells as possible, sometimes being highlighted in blue. But as for the aforementioned card battle, how do you make a fight between Superman, Hulk, Wonder Woman, and Thor lame? Easy! You just had Wanda and Zatanna doing nothing the entire time. At the very least, you could have them turning the heroes into another in very tight situations. You know, kind of working like puppet masters in a way. At least it gives validation to people still salty over Thor losing to Diana. Thankfully, the rest of the fight from here on out gets better. There's this amazing animation of Wanda pulling back the red curtains to morph into her face and then become a 50-foot woman. And then you have Zatanna instantly responding with a Megamind reference and becoming an even bigger 50-foot woman. And then she does the hand towards the screen meme, which technically works as a surprise because the episode displayed a different aspect ratio, akin to the one seen in Might Squared, Wonder Raw, and even Link vs. Cloud 2. Apparently. There were many people who still saw it coming, but even then, maybe you didn't know when it was gonna happen until you see her looking at the camera? Eh, surprise still works for me. Though, I'm not 100% certain why she'd be surprised to see universes when I'm pretty sure this was her power that did this, or at least how else was she gonna protect herself from crumpling all of reality? Ah, well. This is supposed to be payoff to all of that omniversal talk where, well, they're in an omniverse. And we get another visual contrast in Power Sets with Wanda destroying a universe in her hand and Zatanna juggling them and chucking them at Wanda as a belated Trans Visibility Day present. Oh hey, I think this whole thing implies that Wanda's kind of transphobic. But if nothing else, this is where Cassandra Willardy's 
Yeah, her screams at this part of the fight are really well delivered, especially her no more sound. I mean, yeah, not much happened to justify Wanda's rage, but what comes after makes up for it? Silence erupts. Even the music cuts off entirely. Nothing can be heard except for the camera pans. But I think that they make the atmosphere even better because they're leading the viewer to something you would think would be a key moment, only to find out that there's still no sound. Until... <laughs> disappearing act was the first thing dad ever taught me. And if you paid attention earlier, Zatanna's incantation got cut off at first, cause Wanda's an asshat, but she was able to finish it just before Wanda deleted the concept of sound from existence. And then the kill has a stellar setup, but it's off screen for some reason. <sighs> Ah, oh, well, at least this hand-drawn animation for Zatanna is really expressive, and is apparently based on a Bai Shoujo statue of hers. What?! Where do you even find these things? Then we get to the conclusion, and I like how it focuses on their weaknesses and Sirius' cosmologies, with the latter of which they say they are roughly similar in size and scale, so hey, we get to a conclusion where they equalize their stats. That almost never happens. So yeah, I like this episode. I think I get a lot more enjoyment from how well-written the analyses were than the fight itself, but even then, it's still pretty good. It'd be a great episode if it weren't for the lame card fight, but you know what? 76 out of 100. And what happened then? Well, in the community, they say, the fans cheered for Zatanna over 424,000 times that day. Did they just do episodes for three revealed combatants in a row? I, I mean, to be fair, I do appreciate Death Battle doing matchups popular within the deeper parts of the Death Battle community rather than what casuals want. Then again, I'm not 100% certain what kind of matchups casuals wanted for Tanjiro. But then again, it features a guy named Jonathan, spelled correctly by the way. No, 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 let me cook, let me cook. I am sick and tired of Jonathan being spelled like this. Where does this H come from? Seriously, you're saying Jonathan. You're not going Jonathan. You're not breathing. Breathing that hard when you say it. Normalize deleting this H from the face of every name named I, I just ad-libbed so hard I completely lost my train of thought, so. With Tanjiro's analysis, I can't help but feel like he got on the show too early. Like, it's weird, they somehow have no issue spoiling the ending of Attack on Titan well before the ending was animated, nor do they have an issue spoiling an entire character's existence, at least for the time, yet they're too scared to give any half-decent story beats for Demon Slayer despite not having that much content worth hiding. Like, I haven't seen this show, but I am interested in it, exclusively because of Inosuke, but I digress. But the appeal I've heard from people who do watch and enjoy this show, the biggest thing in the beginning of the story is the dynamic between Tanjiro and Nezuko, but it's erroneously skimmed over. They don't really talk about it at all beyond saying Nezuko's a demon and is also Tanjiro's sister. Okay, cool. I guess by this episode's logic, they're about as close as me and my sister. Like, this is a debut of a new series in Season 9, and it also barely gets more coverage than Dig Dug. Why is this the second time this has happened? I didn't ask for two nickels, my dude. I guess the various breathing techniques are well covered, and I liked the info on how breathing can benefit a guy, but that still doesn't make it interesting. Also, a Pickle Rick joke, but with the train? Really, Boomstick? And as for the ending note, okay, the Inosuke reference is based, but why do you end it like that? It comes out of nowhere, and it ends the analysis right then and there. Seriously? <laughs> Come on, man. But as for my analysis, okay, it's really, really good. They nuance me very well by talking about my backstory in depth, go over my personality very well, and end it off with how my bloodline lived on in the form of various other heroes, on top of giving some excellent world building and editing. Even if the humor is also forced, like the ending note being the to be continued meme for some reason. Liam's a huge JoJo fan, so I can understand it, but as someone who's also a huge JoJo fan, it didn't need to be here. Man, if I had a nickel for every anime protagonist who killed monsters with the the power of breathing? Well, that'd be two nickels. I said I didn't ask for two nickels! While my analysis was still very good, at the same time, I can't help but feel it's very unbalanced and skewed towards the JoJo analysis. I don't think I would call it biased, as this is nothing akin to Starscream vs. Rainbow Dash, Ragnar vs. Soul, or Goku vs. Superman 2, because at least they tried to make Tanjiro sound like a cool fighter, but they really should have added more story to Tanjiro's rundown to balance it out more. But then we begin with the fight, and I guess the setup's all right, starting with me trying to protect Tanjiro from Nezuko, not knowing who she is or what her relationship is to Tanjiro. I mean, it's cool, Death Battle doesn't either, Ay Oh! Uh, I'm sorry, sir. 
Did you bump your head? No, my head's okay. But apparently the community during the time thought that this and the puppy line were in any way ableist, despite the fact that they were very obviously referring to the ignorance and innocence at play. As for the rest of the fight, it doesn't start off too well. This whole section is just not the best. But after the zoom punch, it really starts to pick up to a point where it almost feels cinematic at times. The score, the background, the environment, the action, and the general vibe of the fight, when they all come together, it almost makes me forget that this is in sprites. Especially with the way that the characters will stop the fight to process a strategy or something like that. It feels very in line with at least JoJo's for sure, and it never once breaks the pacing. It's kind of hard to describe, but I get chills every time I watch this fight. In spite of its flaws, which yes it does have, like this water effect which doesn't look too great, especially in comparison to the fire fly- Ooh, th that fire looks so good! Mm! And the way that they sneak in little hand-drawn shots to make Tanjiro's movements look faster and faster? Really solid, actually. It just goes so hard. Almost as hard as me lifting the whole 50 plus ton tree off the ground. And they implement all sorts of other cheats like that. Like with the zoom punch I mentioned earlier, all that's really happening is my arm being stretched a tiny bit, placed on top of a layer of speed lines. But they really help sell the sense of speed. And then Tanjiro jumping off the tree to recover, with a nice whiplash effect on the 3D tree, by the way and other moments like the Hinokami Kagura, the colors look less saturated yet still pop without clashing with the art direction. But the climax of the fight is what really makes it special for me. Eventually the music doesn't cut off, but it does dim down enough to put heavy emphasis on Tanjiro's breathing with a very nice usage of reverb effects. I talk a lot about reverb, but it goes a long way in making key moments more effective. Although there is this most unorthodox janky bit where I'm blocking attacks by st but then they start playing around with the colors. This part of the fight has a much darker muted color tone, which works wonders with the atmosphere. But the best part of the fight is where Tanjiro goes into the see-through world to aim for my lungs. And I just casually jump back forward like I'm a jackrabbit on Jupiter. Okay, I would definitely expect a Jojo to do that. But then he stabs me through the chest, and after an intense scream of pain, it's revealed I dodged it by two inches. Okay, this really is perfectly Jojo. And then it leads into the sunlight yellow overdrive which has the best scream of the entire season. Major props to Benjamin Buckley. Not everyone can replicate my vocal cords, but I hope they get you to voicing Shulk when he ends up fighting lightning. But then we get to the ending. I really wish I could say I like it, but for some reason this is the part where people refuse to be civil about. Can't even share my thoughts on the episode without people making a fuss over it, good or bad. Let's just chill out for five sodding minutes and let me explain my case. I agree with some of the criticisms and disagree with the others. Like there are people who say that the tears are comically big and don't really fit a JoJo's death. I mean, are you sure about that? I think the thing that really makes this over the top is the boom sound effect they play. I get that they wanted a more cinematic sound to it all, but it's just so loud that it kind of ruins the impact. But what makes it work for me is what comes after. There's a very somber dark red overlay that adjusts the colors of it all, and then you have me laying Tanjiro to rest, who lets out one last smile and sigh of relief, knowing that Nezuko will be okay, his clothes turning back into their normal color during this moment, which you might see as an animation error, but I see this as a moment where Tanjiro's relief gets some dedicated attention that wouldn't be sold as well if he was in a different color palette. This single shot is probably the best emotional bit of the ending. And then finally, I lay him to rest, reach out my hand towards Nezuko, who is reluctant, but according to Liam, ultimately accepts it, so yeah, I still like this ending. And I know that some people are gonna say, oh, but the emotional endings later on are so much better than this. Wow, it's almost like improvement is a very common thing that every human being on the planet goes through multiple times in their life, and that death battle has specifically gone through several times over across the 13 years it's been a thing. Can't we all just agree that this scene had to walk so its future emotional endings could run? Although to be fair, when I did ask people to discuss this in a community post, every single comment was civil, even the ones who didn't like the ending. So if you're one of those comments, then give yourself extra bragging rights. Yay! And as for the conclusion, okay, I'm a firm believer in 1500 CDO, but I do have to disagree with how they go about it here. Scaling to part 3 DO is pretty capricious to me. I get that he's using my body, sure, but it's not the DO I fought and he had a noticeable power boost in that part. Scaling to Joseph in his prime is perfectly fine. Although I reckon people are still gonna say Tanjiro should have won because something something Liam is biased for Jojo. Ignoring the fact that he's not the only researcher that works on these episodes, so like um... This episode, it's a conflicting one for me to talk about, primarily because it's one of, if not the only episode, where I have to give it two different ratings. If you're more of a Jojo fan, you'll probably love this episode. Its love of the series is woven so 
seamlessly and you can really tell. But if you're more of a Demon Slayer fan, eh, I can't imagine you'll like this episode. I mean, if you're able to look past its issues, I'm happy for you. But given that this is the only Demon Slayer episode Death Battle has done so far, I wouldn't be surprised to hear people having gripes with this one barring the verdict. Even as an outsider, I can tell that this does not do the series justice. But to the people who don't like this episode, keep in mind that I am an immense JoJo fan, so of course this episode was gonna make me happy for how well it captures the series' identity. Even better than Dio Card did. So I'm gonna reluctantly, but happily, give it an 80 out of 100. And if nothing else, it's nice that I received a W on the show. What's that? You're tired of me comparing myself to this guy? Because I'm not a JoJo? Even if you want to ignore the fact that my middle name starts with J-O? How else would you explain this? And this is our fourth revealed matchup in a row. <laughs> What the hell did I just do? But to be fair to the matchup, it grew on me over time during the waiting period. Like, it's just straight up my preferred for both now. I like it a lot more than Thor's other opponents, and especially Vegeta's one other opponent. And remember when I said that Sub-Zero vs. Glacius debuted on my last day of high school? This one debuted in my last week of college. Doesn't quite get the same standards, but it still holds something of a special place in my heart, if nothing else. But anyways, on to the episode. We don't have time for missing legends. Oh, don't we? I hate that I never never knew what was coming in the future. Thor's analysis was okay. It retreads some old ground, but that'll happen when you've had two other episodes. And unlike with Diana, they actually have sufficient new things to talk about, mainly in feats, but it's something. Plus they finally talk about Yarnbjorn and the God Blast. I'm sure that Thor fans were ecstatic to hear these name dropped. And I kind of chuckled at the cutaway, with them kind of accepting that Boomstick is worthy of wielding Mjolnir, not giving any comments or quips, just casually moving on as if Wiz has been aware of this fact for so long. But aside from that, I feel like Thor's character arc was talked about too early. They say that he needed to learn that not every problem could be solved by hitting it really hard, but then they go into some feasts he accomplished by hitting things really hard. Yeah, sure. And in general, the deliveries of the story beats are so blasé. They just say, this thing happened to Thor, now here's some more feats. It doesn't feel paced very well, and it just comes across like a boring respect thread. It's still not awful, just kind of meh. But Vegeta's analysis, on the other hand, oh boy, at first it almost exclusively focused on his abilities and his powered up forms. So I went under the assumption that this was gonna be another respect thread, and I was like, oh gosh, this episode is gonna be way worse than I remember, isn't it? And I'm gonna have to drop another hot take am I? But you don't pay attention to my word choices, do you? Because in the last part of the analysis, it puts the entire puzzle together. Covering his loss against Kakarot and how different his fighting philosophy is from his, and now it all makes sense! All of these feats? All of this respect thread-esque pacing? It's a metaphor! And then they ended off with how he became more than a fighter, which is used as a segue to pointing out how he eventually took down Frieza, who they say at the beginning destroyed his home planet and left him alone, which makes them pointing out his need to prove his race that much more compelling. It's like Cloud's second analysis where it does have a rough start, but as you keep watching it and pay attention to all these little details and subtleties, oh yeah, it's all coming together. Validates me for thinking that Vegeta is one of the only good characters in Dragon Ball. Wait, who said that? Then we go into the fight, and I really like the voice acting so far. Well, for the most part. Jonas Scott's performance as Thor is a massive improvement over his previous one, which was kinda generic, but here he's mixing classic Thor speak with modern Thor speak. The former mainly being at the beginning when he's being a jolly old god, and the latter is mainly used when he's in Warrior's Madness. Nick Landis gets to come back and voice Vegeta, and... It's Nick Landis as Vegeta. I mean, I'm not sure why he's so angry at Thor playing a little trick on him. I feel like the very premise of the fight should have written itself. So I'd imagine this would be another fun sparring match type episode. Like, I feel like every line of dialogue would work much better with this one simple change. Let me break down what I mean by that, starting with this line here. I have evolved beyond gods. This line could have been nuanced as a proper don't underestimate me moment as opposed to just feeling like a reference. And then his I am the prince of all Saiyans line would have come across as bragging rather than a generic non sequitur. But the line that would have benefited from this change the most is this one. Tell me, does a god such as yourself feel fear? 
this would have been a brilliant use of a reference because if this was conveyed as a fun sparring match, it would better fit the original context of this quote. And when they go into their rage modes, there would be way more levity to it because this would be the moment where the viewer goes, oh sh**, someone's about to die. And in case I haven't pointed it out by now, you might notice that damn near Vegeta's entire dialogue in the fight is just references. Oh hey, it's like what they did with Alucard but forgot to add context to why he's saying these things beyond, looky here, it's a reference. I mean, I guess Thor kinda has this too, but that's only in the climax of the fight. And it still works better, but I'll get into it later. Because I wanna talk about how this episode does that thing where the loser gets a ton of hits and the winner does virtually nothing substantial until he gets one lucky hit and magically wins. Although to be fair, the storyboards implied that this was not supposed to be the case. As there was this sequence with Yarnborn that not only has Thor dealing actual damage to Vegeta, but also justifies why Vegeta used Hakai on it. And I mean, I guess you could contextualize this as Thor holding back until he goes into Warrior's Madness, which would make sense to me, but then there's this bit here. Go! by that, my guy. Pretty sure he was kicking your ass throughout a good chunk of the fight. But to the fight's credit, it still has some highlights, such as Thor absorbing the big bang attack and the dialogue, in spite of it being a bunch of lame references, are weaved in in interesting ways. Like Vegeta's all you'll feel is oblivion line is incorporated very naturally. So props to that. Although what is up with your eye, my dude? And then there's the visuals of them preparing the god blast and the final flash, each giving final lines and okay, I need to know, Jonas Scott completely botched the line in his last outing, but how does does he say it here? Feel heaven's wrath! He said it correctly, boys! He finally learned how to say wrath! We did it! Woo! But that doesn't matter because the God Blast doesn't even kill a mountain. But then again, to be fair, that mountain is boundless. But I really like the final flash. Vegeta uses instant transmission to get behind Thor and unleash it. And just look at the sense of scale. It's so massive that it almost looks bigger than the entire planet. And then the screen dips to white. The music fades out. Vegeta relaxes his muscles. But wait, Thor wasn't knocked out. But look at him. His clothing is torn. He's bleeding everywhere. There are bruises all over his arm and face. His helmet is gone and he's panting heavily. I don't think the entirety of, well, either one of Hulk's episodes combined were able to display as much undebased rage as this shot of Thor blasting into the smoke from the destroyed mountain. And then he does an actually decent spin on the MCU line, which I guess technically doesn't make much sense since Vegeta did go for the head, but still, the kill is gnarly as with Thor dragging Vegeta across the sky and using Mjolnir to crush his head. From the hand-drawn shot of Vegeta struggling to break free from Thor's grip, to the astounding sprite work and rigging of Vegeta's head being sandwiched. And then Thor looks towards the dark sky and cries out in victory. No dialogue, no quirky one-liners, only the yell of a prideful warrior in a hard-fought battle. Then we get to the conclusion, and I really wish we could hear it, but for some reason the vocal track keeps ticking my sensory overload. I guess this is just gonna be a thing, Huh. But in their defense, Princess of Pride is phenomenal. The Viking metal aesthetic is such a perfect choice for this matchup. And the harmonizations that Brandon does with Jun Mutsui are just We are the Princess of Pride! But once you're able to hear the conclusion, it is kind of interesting. I think that their degree of determining Ultra Ego's power was a noticeable improvement over Broly's multiplier. Although yes, I know that's not a headcanon, that's actually a fact. Stop saying that! They focus on what power Vegeta needed and determine how much of a power increase it is. And hey, Thor once again got faster, and here's a black box that says Odin Force would have made Thor multiversal in power. Meanwhile, Vegeta had no way to match the God Blast, which could have killed freaking Galactus, and that guy has written the infinite multiverse! Oh, so Odin Force was a nerf this whole time. Uh, that makes sense. Man, this episode is so divisive for me. I mean, I have yet to meet anyone who outright hates it, aside from Prince Vegeta, of course, but it's an episode you either love to no end or just think it's kind of meh. But is it weird that I found this episode disappointing? Like, I think I've explained my issues pretty clearly, but if every part of the fight, or even just the majority of it, was anywhere nearly as good as the ending, this would outright be my second favorite of the season, hands down. Its high points are magnificent, but it's bogged down by some of these major issues for me, and it's frustrating because those could be instantly fixed with a few tiny tweaks. Lest we forget how boring Thor's analysis was, in spite of how quickly they go into the multiversal stuff. But if nothing else, I will say that I like it more than Vegeta. Vegeta vs. Shadow. I mean, go figure, season 9 episode made with a team is better than season 1 episode made by one guy. More news with Captain Obvious tomorrow night. But the funny thing is, it almost wasn't for me. Yeah, I was genuinely thinking about ranking it lower than Vegeta vs. Shadow. Hell, maybe even lower than Thor vs. Wonder Woman due to my impressions on the first half of Vegeta 
Yamcha's analysis, but with how much it gets right, it managed to barely scrape through with a 72 out of 100. I still stand that the choreography is very Korra vs. Storm-esque in the worst possible ways, but man, that ending really does compensate for damn near every issue I have. But if nothing else, just to give it a W that literally no other episode will ever get, during the final school paper I ever had to work on, I had both this and Princes of Pride looping in my head on repeat the entire time I worked on it, and so I speed ran through the entire 20-page essay I had to finish, and despite coming across like the ramblings of a drunken lunatic, I still pass with a good grade. All thanks to these two princes of pride. Okay, now can we please get one episode that doesn't feature any of the teeth combatants? Uh, never mind, I guess. I think I would rather take Boba Fett versus Samus 3. But for real though, I think some ranger's gonna have a bone to pick with the waiting period of this episode. On top of the Omni-Man vs. Bardock fans getting cucked over a matchup that supposedly nobody wanted, despite the fact that I once heard someone say that Omni-Man vs. Homelander had almost as many requests as Thanos vs. Darkseid, which was the most requested death battle of the time. But let's not worry about that, because the marketing for this episode, none of it was intentional, but it got the intention of the Twitter accounts for both Invincible and The Boys. And then after the episode aired, and they say nobody wanted this episode. And clowns. And to think that pretty soon Mortal Kombat is gonna make this episode canon. Make Homelander the most broken character in Mortal Kombat history, and have Omni-Man be the worst one in Mortal Kombat history. That'd be hilarious. But let's go into this sweeperoni of an episode and say how Omni-Man's analysis was really good, actually. Good editing, good pacing, good balance between story and feats, where they start off by painting Nolan as a hero and then immediately go into his villain arc. It's a similar structure to how it goes in the original series. And strangely enough, they don't make any obvious obvious jokes or low-hanging fruit. Aside from making a direct reference to the Think Mark meme, but it's only portrayed as a gag in the background tab, as well as his preview on Rooster Teeth. But even then, that one's kind of a layered reference if you really think about it. And while they do avoid spoilers like with Tanjiro's analysis, I think it mostly makes up for it by showing a really strong coverage of Viltrum, the Viltrumites, and their history. And I even like the cutaway gag with Wiz obsessing over how smart Adam's and Viltrumites specialized DNA is preposterous. And then it has an ending note on how Nolan became human. Ugh, this is so well done, since it's basically a recap of that final scene from Invincible Season 1. I don't have much to complain about, but if I did, I'd probably say that the bit about Boomstick's train pun went on for too long, because I wouldn't imagine him trying to actively seek attention from Wiz for any of his puns, given that Wiz usually reacts to them almost immediately. Also, they spoil a major plot point from around the end of the Invincible comics without giving a spoiler warning. Oops. As for Homelander's analysis, story time. When the Seven Battle Royale first came out, I did not have that much interest in watching the boys. I mean, I did think a couple of the subplots were interesting, but otherwise it just felt like a generic Amazon original live action series that was never gonna pique my interest. But after watching this episode, well, congratulations, Amazon. <clears throat> Death Battle, you got me into checking out the boys, painfully on the nose metaphors notwithstanding. Although, just a quick tangent, I do not enjoy Homelander as much as other people do. Like, don't get me wrong, he's by no means a bad villain, not to even have a percent close. He's great. I just found more interest in the boys and Starlight, even. But as for this analysis, they start off treating him as a product rather than a superhero, which is just perfect. And Boomstick makes a not-so-subtle but not-explicitly-direct jab at the MCU's dominance in the media. And I even like how they handle the parallels with Omni-Man where, while Nolan's similarities with Superman are far more blatant, Homelander's similarities to Superman were literally made up by Vought. It really supports a major point in the conclusion that I'll get into later. And I really like the ending and how they cover how Homelander was always under Vought's thumb and his new child, for lack of a better term, was a really nice note and fit naturally with how they've been telling his story, and how his lack of control was semi-alleviated in spite of how unjustifiable and faulty it is. Although it is surprising that this is one of, if not the only analysis of the season that doesn't have any black boxes. In fact, in general, this whole episode has only one pop-up and it's in Nolan's analysis. And I can't imagine it be because of the amount of spoilers that they'd have to cover, or the length of their series, because Afro Samurai is only two manga volumes, five anime episodes, and a movie, yet Afro's rundown still had multiple pop-ups. But I still think this is a solid analysis. With my least favorite cutaway of the season, like, okay, okay, I know what they were trying to do here. They wanted to go over the insane amount of weirdness in the boys' comics, and how edgy they can be, but why do you need to describe this in detail? Why do you need to talk about it for so long? 
Like, even ignoring how gross it is hearing them talking about it, I think just showing the panel on screen should be enough to tell the audience that the comics are really weird. You don't need to talk about it for this long. I'm gonna be f to keep track of this, so I'm having Deadpool do it for me. <laughs> Whatever, man. L let's just talk about the fight already. Why is it Christmas? Christmas? Well, I guess it was only a matter of time where stores would gaslight people into celebrating Christmas seven months before December. But I actually have a theory for that. And when you see Christmas decorations or just the general vibe, you feel peaceful, calm. It makes you feel happy. And I'd argue that it not only makes this setup so much better and more terrifying than you might think it adds, but along with its many other factors, it single-handedly makes it the best setup of the entire show Actually, I guess. It's a full minute in a three minute fight, but there's a lot to unpack here. It starts with Homelander already in Nolan's house, calling him his neighbor, drinking his hot cocoa despite offering some, and just talking as if he owns the place. What's he doing here? Surely Nolan wouldn't leave his house unprotected, right? Even Nolan's face is lined up in a way where Homelander has the best view. And then there's a shot of Nolan looking around. Hmm, I wonder what that's all about. And then you have Homelander giving one of his signature speeches in a very Homelander way. You know, with all the mumbling, all the pausing, the emphasizing of certain words. I'm sure you've heard this analysis from many other people before. But then Homelander is staring at a family portrait of Nolan, Mark, and Debbie. All of these shots just seem really peculiar. And I don't know what that's all about. What do you think, Debbie? <laughs> that was my honest reaction to when I saw it in the sneak peek. <laughs> Especially with the music doing a little shing sound when Debbie's skeleton is front and center and builds up to portray Nolan's rising fury. And then he drops this banger line. I'm going to feed you your own heart. Damn. This was immaculate. And Omni-Man's rage? Totally justified. I mean, this dweeb breaks into Nolan's house while he was gone, murders his wife, tries to get all buddy-buddy with him, only to end up belittling him just because he believes that Nolan's family isn't nearly as vital as his brand, and yet he has the gall to tell Nolan to get out of his country? Yeah, I think he should be doing a lot more than making him eat his own heart. And then they start throwing hands, and there's not as much to talk about. It's still good action with well-implemented references. I just don't have that much to say. It's well-animated. I like the plane scene. I like how they utilize Homelander's single noteworthy advantage. It's all there, it's all fine, and I don't actively dislike any of it. Except for this beatdown right here. Obviously, I wasn't expecting Homelander to be smashed through the wall right away, but I was at least expecting his body to show literally any damage or visible contortion. Like, if this is supposed to be Nolan's fury being unleashed, I would have liked the hits to have felt more impactful, even if these are the starting punches. But to be fair, it mainly gets saved by this line right here. Country? Seriously? I'm not here for your country. That is such a good take on one of his most iconic lines. Seriously, I thought that they were just gonna include it word for word, but no, they put an incredibly brilliant spin on it. Even the fight in the air has plenty of references. Not just the plane scene, but in general, the dialogue they have feel like a nod to the scenes where Nolan is teaching Mark how to use his powers by having him do exactly that to Homelander. Although this does end up being one of those fights where Nolan starts dominating the entire fight. This actually works as an appeal for many people, myself included. See, the thing about stomp fights, first of all, stop whining about a matchup being a stomp because in theory, every matchup is a stomp the moment you decide on who wins. But with this one in particular, the nature of the matchup and even some of the sentences from this character's analyses have a lot of emphasis on that one of the guys clearly has more humanity than the other. And the other guy with noticeably less humanity People wanted to see get stomped into the dirt, especially with the way that both characters are framed in their own series. This doesn't appeal to everyone, but it does appeal to me, and if you don't see it that way, then cool. Cool, cool, cool. But I think this dynamic works insanely well during the climax. First of all, I really, really like the atmosphere. It may just be the neighborhood streets being on fire, but it allows for plenty of creative shots, like this menacing shot of Nolan slowly moving forward through the flame, and the silhouette shot where they're being highlighted by red and blue outlines. And then there's the scene where Homelander is focusing his heat vision on Nolan's face as he lets loose with a temper tantrum. Young Ya does such a stellar job at making Homelander sound furious and desperate. The cracks in his voice and the generally visceral energy makes this scene impeccable. But of course, Nolan made a very important promise to Homelander. And the kill itself also works as a nod to the scene where Nolan kills the Guardians of the Globe. And the conclusion does not try to sugarcoat how big of a stomp it was. But what really gets me is this line right here. Despite Homelander's 
dominance within the world of the boys, he's a big fish in a small pond. As well as this one too. One is a warrior, and the other is a bully. Even though Homelander isn't the highlight of the boys for me, it does lead into something that's genuinely genius from a versus standpoint. Homelander isn't just a big fish in a small pond, but him being super weak from a versus standpoint actually adds to the entire point of his character. Go onto a site like Versus Wiki for instance, you'll notice that he's weaker than a basic tornado, along with so many other characters in fiction, and he loses to damn near all of his real opponents. And that's another part of what makes this stomp fight work so well for me. So yeah, with all of this in mind, while I don't think it's a masterpiece, it's a great episode nonetheless. It perfectly executes what it sets out to do, it's a more character-driven fight, and it has a basically flawless setup. And none of it is outright bad, barring a few of the lame jokes and Homelander's cutaway gag, but as much as I revere the beginning and end, the middle isn't as interesting to talk about in comparison. But again, it's not because it's bad. I just simply give it an 83 out of 100. Sorry to shatter the stars in your eyes for hoping this would be the fully scripted rundown. That's because I genuinely didn't have as much to talk about as I would have liked. But hey, don't let this distract you from the fact that this was still an episode that needed to be made. Don't at me. <laughs> Truth be told, this was the episode of the season I was the most excited for when it was announced, or even when it was just teased. Yes, I know that Tetsuo was the character they were teasing, but everyone was saying, ah, he's gonna be fighting Magneto, and I was like, dude, Magneto was literally my most wanton combatant for well over half a decade. Like, he's literally my favorite Marvel character of all time, as well as being one of my favorite villains in all of fiction. Plus, he has so many really cool powers and a compelling story that Death Battle could absolutely talk about in interesting ways. I was one of the only people who didn't give a hoot about Tetsuo being on the show. Like, what the f*** is an Akira? I do want to check out the movie, though, as I've heard it's really, really good. Can you blame me for being ecstatic that one of my all-time favorite characters was finally making his debut on the show? Please say no. And just like with Omnilander, the fight being a total washout actually worked to his benefit, not just in the animation, but in the analyses as well. These rundowns have a lot more focus on the stories and abilities when compared to most other rundowns, at least in this season. Like if they spend more time discussing numbers and feats, I highly doubt that they'd have as much time dissecting Magneto's backstory, or the contrast with Charles Xavier, or even the inspiration for X-Men characters in general, at least in terms of Xavier's motivations, or how they end off with how he became more of a good guy and even led the X-Men on a few occasions. This is the polar opposite of other analyses like with Strange vs. Fate or more relevantly Wanda vs. Atana, where I don't want them to talk about feats. But if you have to bring in the scaling, summarize it as best as you can to avoid making the conclusion wrong by its own logic, and just get to the stuff I want to hear about. And they did exactly that. They may not have covered any universal or Martel forbid omniversal shenanigans, but they still put him really high, and given how all the abilities are explained in ways that build up to his dumb you? That's just so good retroactively. And as for Tetsuo's analysis, there was also a lack of direct versus content, being as vague as mag Nito's feats. And you could argue that this being a new series would work to its detriment, but I personally didn't see it that way. Even if they do seem kind of wishy-washy in terms of what they buy for Tetsuo, like how they disagree with Universal Tetsuo, but also don't give at least a statement at how powerful the blast actually is. But otherwise, it's still a blend of verses and story that's just as seamless. And I also like how they consistently differentiate the manga and anime storylines throughout the rundown, from minor things like a difference in what year it takes place in, to major things like how the stories end. It's necessary information that's also paced really well. Instead of going back and forth over every single thing, they give general summaries of the world of Akira, its characters, and other things, and only point out the differences when covering vital plot points. And as for the fight, you might think that I love the fight exclusively for the ending? Yes and no. The start of the fight isn't super interesting, at first. Generally good stuff with a perfect lean into the post-apocalyptic setting of Akira. And it also does an impeccable job of effortlessly blending sprites with 3D objects. I guess that's because telekinesis powers make them feel more natural since they never actually touch the objects. But moments like Magneto using cars to block Tetsuo's signs look really nice. And seeing the red and purple borders on them work as neat visual cues to highlight who's controlling the debris. And I think these visual cues work best in this part 
where Max uses his powers to mitigate as much damage as possible, where it adds purple coloring on top of the car ball entirely. And after Mr. Pringles cuts off Tetsuo's arm, he makes a completely new metal arm out of a huge variety of scraps. And we even see him grunting in struggle after he beats Mags up a bit. Notice how the arm is distinctly framed from the rest of his body. Of course it does have them utilizing this singular building for a good chunk of this section, but I never saw this as a problem, nor did I find it weird. Like Magneto uses a building in an attempt to crush Tetsuo, who uses his single natural arm and mental powers to catch it. And then he drops it to assault Mags, who then uses that same building to try and catch him off guard. It doesn't work, but this is a decent way of demonstrating his superior intelligence and creativity as opposed to Tetsuo's more straightforward approach. And then their psionic powers clash with a sublime fusion of the red and purple attack trail coupled with some lightning and wave effects. And this is also where the track focuses on the more dramatic moments of the fight. Ego Death is already a really cool track, but it complements the fight extremely well, dampening the synth beats as it isolates the orchestral parts of the track over time. This highlights the shot of Magneto's helmet being destroyed and the monstrous transformation I'll get to in a bit. And then Mag starts to choke Tetsuo with his own metal arm, as his eyes are glowing red, which have been hidden in black throughout most of the fight, but this is where he becomes pissed off. And this struggle forces Tetsuo to go into his monster mode, where the music is almost entirely replaced with the choir noises, kind of like the ones from the soundtrack of the Akira movie. This whole transformation looks terrifying in the best way, not to mention the mushy sound design of Tetsuo's eye moving around. But speaking of eyes, Magneto's eyes are no longer red, now they're black again, but this time they're showing how he's afraid of this transformation, especially when he hears the faint screams and cries of Tetsuo as he's stuck inside the monster form. And the sound balancing is really well done as if they have different thoughts coming through both ears. You know how sometimes when you wear headphones you'll only hear sound coming through one ear? Or you'll hear different sounds coming through either ear? It's basically that, but intentional. Except for the clearest message of them all. Hurts. Help me. <laughs> Once again, look at Magneto's eyes. At the beginning of the fight, they're obscured by his helmet, because he doesn't have any care for this, let's just say, impudent child. But then they start glowing red after he gets tired of him and his tantrums. But once he sees that monster and hears Tetsuo's plea for help, they become clearer, starting off as translucent before being filled with white. And yeah, there's that hand-drawn shot that also has his eyes white, and that other one where he's being choked, but with the former shot, that's just him being taken aback from this impudent child rushing up to him while he was observing the environment. And as for the latter shot, I reckon it's to portray Magneto in a rare moment of shock that this impudent child would dare harm him. But then Tetsuo clutches Mags in a tight grip, with even more flawless blending of sprites and hand-drawn objects. And then he unleashes the Big Bang, which Mag f***ing Nito catches in his hands and redirects it, but his focus is on freeing Tetsuo rather than killing him. Why does he do that? Well... The poor child. That's the sympathy. This is the emotional ending that I was hearing could happen during the waiting period, and when I saw this, I knew what was coming, and I almost started to tear up a little. One of my all-time favorite characters Death Battle has ever used was being handled to essential perfection, and now it's as good a time as ever to say that Edward Bosco's Magneto is my favorite performance of the show, just straight up. It captures the exact Tom Kane sounded like I wanted, emphasizing his consonants and vowels at the beginning, but after he says that poor child line, he eases is up. And for those who might not know, Tom Kane was forced to retire from voice acting following a stroke. And while he did appear in a few games afterwards, because he was still able to record plenty of lines before that happened, many people, myself included, were disappointed that we would never get to hear the definitive Magneto voice ever again. But then Death Battle hired Edward Bosco and they just said, okay, let's have him pull a pitch perfect Tom Kane impression out of his ass. No, he didn't pull it out of his ass, he pulled it out of his heart. Oh yeah, and Joshua Waters does a good Tetsuo. Very edgy, very aggressive but also good at handling the emotions when he needs to. But of course I need to talk about the rest of the fight. Mag slices Tetsuo's monster form in half, who crashes out towards him, and then Mag just puts Tetsuo out of his misery. He doesn't do anything super complex, he just points his finger and goes boom followed by this hand-drawn shot that I do think looks a bit funny. I know those blue circles are supposed to be tears, and I'd imagine that giving them movement would have hindered the impact of the scene even more, but at the same time, this was not originally in the storyboards at all. Origin the Pogchamp added this scene because he really thought it would make this emotional ending work. Weird tear placement aside, I think it still works, especially with the ending exchange just being a thank you. And yeah, I need to gush about this real quick because I don't always have the best of luck when it comes to my favorite characters being on the show. I 
can only name a few characters that I can definitively say I enjoy more. One was handled pretty well in an episode I thought was decent, one was handled very well in an episode I thought was below decent, and one was... well, I think I've made my case thousands of times over. But Magneto is just straight up my favorite portrayal of a character that they've ever done. I don't even need to sugarcoat it. The analysis covered everything I would have wanted him to cover, the animation portrayed him perfectly, Edward Bosco became a worthy successor to Tom Kane in my opinion, and I wouldn't mind if he started voicing the character officially, like not in the slightest. And the writing, oh my goodness. This was DJ the Tiki's debut, and this is my favorite writer's debut of any episode. 97 out of 100. What else can I say, but thank you, Death Battle. Thank you. I can't believe this episode was teased in so many ways. I mentioned this last time, but Magneto vs. Tetsuo was the episode where I finally got around to joining the community properly. Albeit it was more so the aftermath, or at least the day before it premiered for first members, but this episode's waiting period was the first one I got to experience with the community. And a few of those people got me into watching Lego Monkey Kid. Seriously, go watch that show, it is even more based than people say it is. But it has Sean Shemmel in what I consider to be his best role, better than Son Goku. Wait, did I say that out loud? Although despite English being one of my three majors, I didn't really check out mythology as much as you might think, and despite one of the required courses being world literature, where I had to study various works of literature from ancient history across multiple countries, Journey to the West was somehow not one of those works I had to study, and I can't imagine its importance in Buddhism would have been a factor because I went to a religious university, but I don't know. All that matters is that this got the attention of the mythology guy, and yeah, all he did was make a reaction to the episode, and I really wish he did a full-on analysis of it, talking about the thing that they got right and wrong, but it's always cool to see Death Battle getting direct attention from other communities. But now let's talk about this episode from my perspective, why don't we? Hercules- <coughs> Heracles' analysis was good. I like how they didn't bother sugarcoating the craziness of mythology and how weird it can get. Yeah, I don't know too much about mythology myself, but I've always known about the Milky Way galaxy's origin. <laughs> Though I don't get the joke about Boomstick's wife supposedly dying. I thought he was divorced, not widowed. I think what makes this analysis and by extension this episode stand out are the variety of visuals. Not only do they use the comics and film adaptations, but they also use art pieces like paintings, statues, and pottery. And they're all edited like they would edit comic panels. Although there is this bit where they say 90 times faster than light, uh, that's 100 times FTL. But my favorite part about these analyses are the way that Wiz and Boomstick are utilized. You know how I once said that one of Boomstick's most imperative purposes was to simplify the versus jargon for a casual audience? Well, that's used throughout this entire analysis. They have Wiz using the flowery language and dramatic speaking patterns from the original mythology stories, and Boomstick is the one to help unpack it for the viewer that may or may not understand, but without breaking the immersion of people who do understand it all. Even when Wiz breaks character a couple of times, it's only when he needs to bring up the differences in Heracles' tales. And as for Sun Wukong's analysis, it's pretty interesting as well. Sun was like, hey, I can do that too! What the hell did you just say? Obviously, I have even less to say than I do with Heracles' analysis, but it does the whole editing thing, it still has Wiz and Boomstick with their dynamic, and it also has the Buddha, an awakened divine being liberated from the cycle of life and death entirely. Oh! Oh! Really going there, huh? Okay, look, I'm gonna hold my tongue and not give a definitive opinion on what I truly think of Sun Wukong's analysis, so if any Buddhists in the chat feel comfortable giving me their thoughts on it, like with the whole Buddha thing, I'm all ears. But until then, I'm gonna link this blog by Jim R. McClanahan, otherwise known as Sun Xing Zhe, who gives a scholarly analysis of the episode. It's a genuinely fascinating read that not only analyzes the episode, but also gives all sorts of fun facts and obscure trivia related to Journey to the West. Don't exo surprise when he says that he wasn't a huge fan of the episode, but I still recommend giving it a read, especially if you don't know too much about the original story. Also, he completely ratios Death Battle fan and you'll love to see it. For now, let's talk about the fight. And right off the bat, we get a sneak peek at the voice acting. Blythe Mellon and Alex Mai are good in their respective roles, but my favorite performance had to go to Christian Young as the narrator. He has a very warm and charismatic voice that still adds grandeur to more dramatic scenes when they need it. 
This was an idea the team had, because this was the first mythology death battle, so I guess it'd be appropriate to help it stand out as much as possible. Though I am curious about where they got Wukong's design. I don't dislike the design, I think it's pretty cool, but I don't think I've seen Wukong's design look like this in any source that I've looked into. And I'm also not sure why Wukong attacks Heracles after pranking him with the golden apple. Shouldn't Heracles have been the one instigating the fight? Ah, whatever. I really like the style of the fight, with the ink trails especially reminding me of Okami in Street Fighter 4 and generally just fitting the ancient mythology vibe really well. The Monkey King's strike rang true, but he'd not so easily overwhelm the God of Strength. He then proceeds to overwhelm the God of Strength with teleports and clones, and his staff directly breaks his sword, but okay. I do like Heracles yanking Wukong's staff to uppercut him, even if his I am Heracles line comes way too early. But then again, given the vibe of the fight, I bet it would feel shoehorned regardless, so it's kind of tough to work with, and at that point I would just prefer not having the line at all. And then there's this arrow fight, which is kind of peculiar. On the one hand, I like the speed that Heracles is firing his arrows, and it's a very smooth animation. But on the other hand, why do they not seem to have Hydra Venom? Like, they show the Venom later on, but what's going on here? They pierce the clones, yet the smoke clouds are the same as the ones from earlier where Wukong is evading attacks. Unless the episode is establishing that he still has normal arrows, but it's still a way to raise the stakes later on in the fight, so whatever. Then Wukong uses his animal transformations to attack Heracles, who just stops shooting arrows for some reason. Though I do like how this is supposed to reference the statue of him holding the snakes as a baby. Alright, I see you, I see you. <laughs> and then Heracles uses his Crotala to get rid of all of the clones at once, which I hear wouldn't work like this, but to be fair, I don't see any other way he'd be able to get rid of all of the clones in a single attack. And I reckon that they wanted to convey a moment where Heracles is so overwhelmed by the monkey clones that he uses a fix-all, or I guess end-all solution, as he has nothing else. Keep in mind, his arsenal, at least from what Death Battle gives him, isn't that big. And just like with Jim's blog, this fight completely ratios the Death Battle fan in Wiki by having Wukong survive his head coming off and growing three more, which leads to a very fun reference to the Hydra with Heracles sounding peeved. And while the fight is a bit stiff on Wukong's end, it can't be helped. It looks like a really tough sprite to work with regardless. And now we get to see Heracles shooting the Hydra Venom arrows to destroy the transformation. And then we see this scene. This better have been a Lego Monkey Kid reference or else I swear to heaven on high. But then we have one last clash and it's really confusing. So as a contrast to the multiple people who decided to skip this episode for personal reasons, Death Battle explained that they were not going to dive into the religions that these characters were associated with, nor were they going to portray them as their god forms. Well, what would you call this then? Something tells me this is meant to be symbolic, meaning that Sun Wukong is not only the stronger fighter, but also the stronger god. But at the same time, not only does this go against that initial premise, but it kind of subtracts from the fight, ironically enough. Like, compared to how creative the action and choreography were on the scroll, which to be fair, I do like the multiple shots foreshadowing this moment, the final exchange is just a basic smack with a weapon. Doesn't help that Wukong explains what just happened as if the viewer couldn't see it for themselves. Besides, you're telling me that Harry Heracles could no-sell this attack, yet a basic strike that he technically countered at the beginning of the fight was too much for him? Although I will give them props for this one detail, I really like how the stars stemming from their powers are spelling ancient Greek and Chinese pinyin respectively. I feel like these translate to actual words, and I have no idea what they could mean, but it's still a cool attention to detail. And then the conclusion is fairly on point, with their main argument boiling down to Wukong's arsenal being far more versatile and deadly, as well as being quintillions of times faster, and Heracles' single win condition was too specific to base an argument around. I think the only main issue I have is that they don't do a great job of justifying their strengths being equal, at least with Wukong's case. From what I understand, they're using the right feet, but they don't establish a difference between sky and heaven. Meanwhile, with Heracles, they outright say he held the infinite universe, which is a much clearer picture than Wukong's feet. And as for the track, Hero's Journey, I understood that reference, Mr. Campbell, is pretty good. It even has an epilogue track that only exists just because Therwolf had that much fun making it. I think it would have been a perfect track for the conclusion in all honesty, but eh, go check it out. It's really peaceful and cool. But anyways, as for the first mythology fight ever, I'd say it was a fun one. It does have some issues in the writing and fighting aspects that prevent it from being as special as it sounds on paper, but I still say I enjoyed it. And at the end of the day, it is mythology guy approved, so that's a real W. 74 out of 100. Though going forward, let's not be discriminatory towards other religions and mythology fights, please and thank you. I do <laughs> actually think Pikachu beats Judeo Christian oh my God. Gosh. <laughs> and we please do Pikachu versus God. <laughs> Or we could have the death battle team indirectly encourage this kind of behavior for no reason. That is an option.
I know this was a popular matchup, but I never really understood the appeal of it. I get that the general theme is more than just space hunters, because there's something with like a tribal thing and there's honor and bound, but my question is, why did it need to be Boba Fett? Wouldn't it have worked better if it was Mandalorian versus Predator? Not to be confused with THE Mandalorian, as him versus Courier goes hard, but if the intent with the Predator was to composite the entire race and essentially have it be a single entity rather than a specific Predator, what was the point of bringing back Boba Fett? That's just something I can't wrap my head around. But as for the episode itself, you know that the episode has little going for it when the most replayed part is them saying the year 1987. Also, Five Nights at Freddy's memes are objectively unfunny and lame, and I'm tired of pretending they're not. As for the stuff that's in the analysis, specifically with Boba Fett's, his last episode was seven years ago, and there's barely any new stuff about him. We learn a few things about Mandalorian, see numbers for feats previously discussed, and the funny stick, but that's all the new stuff we get. They reuse the same story beats and even a couple of the same jokes. And if you're gonna do that, at least try to be funny, but the most reactionary I got with anything in this analysis was with Dummy randomly going on a tangent about how much he hates humans and how he calls them meat bags, which basically appears for no reason, so the reaction gout out of me was confusion. Good job, you made me think Dummy was worthless. Wait, okay, so when I first watched Predator's Rundown, I was bored through a good chunk, but assumed it was good because of how they analyzed Predator as a species rather than a single combatant. However, I've heard the many tales and testimonies and now I understand. Though I get Death Battle's intent. It was to analyze them as a tribal species with emphasis on a specific Yaucha. I think this would have been a really cool way to match Boba's Rundown, but they fall short in how they never mention that they're gonna be looking at a specific Yaucha. Oh wait, we are looking at one specific Yaucha. It's John Yausha. We'll talk about him in a bit. Because, funny meme or not, this makes his respect thread feel painfully mundane. Even by respect thread standards. And then they end it off with a random quote from the Predator movies that I didn't get on my first watch. But now I do, and I dislike it even more. Especially knowing how little they added to the analysis. But onto the fight. Okay, I really like the idea of it being more of a hunt than a fight. Where John Yausha is hunting Boba, who has to rely on his unique tactics to survive. In a way, you could argue that this is a lot like Carnage vs. Lucy, and while I did still find the choreography boring, I would love to have seen this idea properly handled in a future episode. And there's a reason why I still want that, because this fight does not do that justice. To be fair, Death Battle choreography does kinda like to do the whole person A attacks and person B lets them finish first, but for me at least, it's often hard to notice either because the fighting is really fast to make up for it, the nature of the matchup makes it okay, or some other reason. But here, it really feels as if they stand still and do nothing way too often. Like there's this moment where Boba is shooting his blaster at John Yaucha, who dodges all of his shots by standing here. And then he fires a slow moving ring thingy that Boba lets himself get hit by despite being on a jetpack. And then there's this moment where John Yaucha throws his boomerang cipher that Boba also lets himself get hit by and is caught completely unaware despite John Yaucha directly saying that he had him on top of Boba having 360 degree radar. Which he already used in the episode before this moment, so how did this happen? And then there's also this moment where John Yaucha knocks Boba down goes for a side strike, and then stops for no reason, despite Boba never once moving. Stop him! At least put your foot down! But to its credit, it's not always like this, as when they get to melee weapon combat, these attacks look really swift and smooth. Honestly, some of the best action animation of the 3D episodes aside from Harley Jinx. And since John Yaucha is physically stronger, you could have him no-selling Boba's explosives at the start of the fight, forcing Boba to rely on dodging the projectiles and outside-the-box tactics. In other words, using his superior arena control and tactics in a way that's exactly like what the conclusion argues. But no, instead let's have Boba use basic strategies on what's supposed to be an experienced hunter. Or let's have this single grenade invoke a bigger explosion than what was supposedly John Yaucha's trump card, the sweet guy explosion. Also, I just generally don't like the look of the fight too much. Not that the environment is bad, but more that Boba's armor blends in with the environment in ways that I'm pretty sure weren't intentional. Not to mention John Yaucha's dreads can't decide between being hard or flaccid. Also, that grenade explosion looks awful. At least move the green screen so where you can't see the bottom of it. Oh, and another thing that I personally found confusing as an outsider, I did not know that John Yaucha had voice replication. The analysis outright forgot to bring this up, so I was so confused as to how John Yaucha was talking. But then after the explosion, it causes the force to get on fire, and it does have some cool moments. Like Boba Fett using a lightsaber to cauterize his arm, and we do get some more awesome melee combat. But then John Yaucha's mask comes off, and it's revealed that he was a Redditor the whole time. 
time. And then Boba Fett drops a forced reference. Seriously, it should have been something like, eh, I've seen worse. Tweak the reference line to have Boba say something like, I've seen worse. I think something better like, I've seen worse, would have been way more in character for Boba Fett. Like how he's seen worse or something. Or my personal favorite just, ah, I've seen worse. Yeah, that. Also, it's really weird how the flamethrower that Boba Fett uses did not mess up his infrared vision, and he outright tanked the lightsaber at first, and then the plasma scythe breaks, kind of, and then John Yaucha activates his sweet kite explosion very slowly, with Boba Fett doing nothing to stop it, and on the one hand, I really like the ending shot of Boba walking off while carrying his severed arm, breathing heavily. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if this was supposed to convey that Boba was running away from the explosion, but there's a reason why you never have your left hand say what your right hand is doing, because chances are that one hand has a lot more damning things to bring up. Like, I'm sure you've heard the point that the conclusion says that Boba Fett was supposed to run away from the explosion, or at least get a away from its epicenter, yet the shot heavily implies that he tanked the explosion head on. But to me, this is just further proof that the conclusion was not written well in the slightest. Why was John Yaucha beating him in ranged combat despite them saying Boba Fett had the edge in that field? Why did the fire that for the most part was off to the side mess up his infrared vision, yet the flamethrower Boba Fett used it didn't do that at all? Why was Boba Fett's dirty tactic the equivalent of a hamburger helper mascot with pointy teeth? Even if the fighting is well animated, virtually nothing in this fight makes any sense to me, and it makes me even more curious as to why it was made in the first place. But look, I don't hate this episode, but after thinking about what it could have been, it's honestly the most disappointing episode of the season for me. And yes, I know what's coming soon, and I still stand by that. I really wanted to like this episode, but all they did was make me care about the matchup even less. 43 out of 100. John Yaucha vs. Kuwabara when though? <laughs> This episode of Death Battle is sponsored by Warframe. Oh boy, I know where this is going. In all seriousness, I hope that y'all are happy that I'm talking about the bonus episode in the proper order for once. I don't have as much to say about this one compared to last time, but I will say that the analyses are really fun in the sense that it's literally just a versus debate between the two. It's also like Macho Man versus Kool-Aid Man in the sense that both analyses are combined into one single analysis. And Boomstick even brings up Raiden using vague connections and themes as if it's a matchup they just came up with. That's exactly exactly how I come up with matchups, so it's really cool to see it happening from the big boys who host the show. And there's also some other cool stuff like learning about Warframes and Excalibur specifically, talking about all the various weapons and going into Excalibur's backstory, which leads us into the aforementioned transition into Raiden's analysis. I mean, his was just okay. He's a returner for a bonus episode, so there was never going to be much to work with. My only real complaint was that the ending felt like a sluggish recap of his fight with Armstrong, but that's about it. And then we get to, oh wait, there's more to the analysis? And it's playing in the hall of the Mountain King as Wiz and Boomstick are having a nerd debate? Wait, was that a calc off? And Boomstick won? <laughs> Alright, I'm actually digging this. This is really charming. <laughs> And strangely enough, it has the best delivery of Boomstick saying it's time for a death battle. Maybe it's carried by the alarm sounds, I don't know, but it's such a cool delivery. What, why are you cutting to an ad? <laughs> Alright, ad's over, so let's talk about the fight. Yeah, it's good. The fight doesn't have too much to talk about, it's just fast-paced fun throughout. This fight just wants to throw a bunch of dumb action your way, which feels pretty intact to how this episode was brought up by the host in the first place. I like this part where they run across the buildings. It's janky, but in a way that's fun. And the infinite ammo bit was a pretty fun gag, as well as getting to showcase Raiden's unique weapons, which he did not do in his previous episode, by the way, so it's nice to know that this episode can actually stand out. Although since I brought up that episode, you might be curious as to how I feel about Raiden's new voice. And yeah, it is so much better than his other one, where I was heavily critical of Raiden's voice actor in that one, but here, Mortal really does sound like Raiden, implementing the growliness that was severely lacking in Tim Page's performance. I also think that the closest we get to banter in this fight, that being this line from the beginning of the episode, was a really fun line that sounds like something he'd say, whereas a lot of Tim Page's Raiden was kind of forced in a way, even if I do like the comedic lines. As for other moments, I like the part where Wiz and Boomstick hijack the fight because it's their matchup and they get to enter interfere with it if they want to, even though the Lotus instantly cuts Wiz off the line, but it has some great comedic deliveries, and the cardboard box bit is indeed a lot of fun. But then we get to the kill, and I like the idea. Excalibur uses his rifle to nullify the Murasama's high-frequency tech, making the killing blow much easier to land, and seeing it go from red to blue was a very nice touch, but otherwise, it's just a basic slice where you can barely see Raiden getting split in half, and then his sword just falls to the ground, and the foundry foreshadowed at the beginning is just finished, I guess. Though what's interesting is that the storyboards had a lot of cut content. 
Some of it adds more polish to the choreography, and a bunch of other scenes were just outright removed. Even a standing here mo- Okay, I hate Death Battle now. But aside from that, yeah, it's a good episode. It may just be a 7 out of 10 to me, likely somewhere in the low mid end of 7 out of 10, but if it means anything, I consider this to be the true mid-season finale of Season 9. I'll let you determine if that's more of a compliment to Excalibur vs. Raiden, or another diss on Boba Fett vs. Predator. Either way, I think it's really funny saying it out loud, not gonna lie, braggers. <laughs> So, when this matchup was unofficially revealed at RTX 2022, the response was volatile, in a way. Bond's biggest matchup was against Jason Bourne, and it makes sense because there was something of a rivalry, at least for a while, and they both have a lot of gadgets that can play off of one another. But then Bond vs. Wicks suddenly started getting popular among casuals, and then Death Battle did this matchup instead. I mean, personally, I think it works thematically and atmospherically, if nothing else, but as far as the fight dynamic goes, <laughs> Sorry, wiki boy. I'll check out your movies one day. If it means anything, I could see both characters coming back in the future. Or at least Wick. Eh, whatever. Let's just talk about the episode. I may have only seen one Bond movie, but I do remember liking it, and Bond's analysis was mostly good, if not a bit clunky. I like how they covered his various history and his days as a broken man, even going as far as to talk about his temporary retirement from the Secret Service. I didn't even mind the multiple sex jokes because, well, this is James Bond we're talking about. He does have a lot of sex. Although, why was this considered the gay sex episode? Like, what about these two screamed gay sex? Like, seriously, people. Thorgita was right there! But my problem with the analysis is the structure of the ending. I think they have a very strong ending note right here, but then they just start going into feats, and it's very underwhelming, especially since the ending note they actually go with isn't nearly as compelling. To be fair, their coverage of his mental state was nice. I feel like it would have been more impactful if they talked about it after his feats, as opposed to being directly before. But John Wick's analysis, however, I do think it has a really good intro, where Boomstick is the one to give the opening spiel, and his delivery is good enough to keep the viewer invested, and then Wiz drops his response as, yes, and the delivery catches you off guard because it's that funny. Although they do call him a Sigma male, so maybe I don't like the analysis as humor that much at all. It's also kind of weird how they cover Keanu Reeves. He's an epic human being, don't get me wrong, but they cover his full martial arts repertoire only to say that John Wick only uses Krav Maga, so I'm not sure what the point of this was. Yes, Krav Maga is supposedly a combination of the best martial arts, but they never elaborate on how that's the case for him specifically. Otherwise, I do like quite a bit of this rundown. I like how it portrays him as an unstoppable killing machine in a way that actually parallels Bond really well, bringing up his total body count and how short of a time span it was, and highlighting the various ways he's been able to achieve it. But once again, the pacing feels odd. As much as I appreciate Boomstick's opening spiel, it references the death of Wick's dog, which is fine, but then the second half of the analysis covers the importance of his dog and the fact that it was killed. Like, I'm not 100% sure on this, but wouldn't it have made more sense if the elaborate on his dog was at least somewhat explained in the opening spiel. I don't know, I just feel like that would have worked better. But there is one thing that I have explicitly been ignoring, and it's prevalent in both analyses. But I feel like now is a good time to talk about it. The Bond film references. On the one hand, I think it's a very fun idea, and they're weaved into the script very seamlessly. I mean, sure, it wasn't always subtle, but in the conclusion, Boomstick admits his need to shoehorn them at the end of the gag, and with that context, I really like how they worked in Octopussy. But on the other hand, they did not need to be in Wick's rundown at all. Or if it did, it should have been balanced out by making some Wick references in Bond's analysis or something. Heck, even the cutaway gag in Wick's analysis is just a continuation of the one from Bond, yet somehow it's disorganized. Boomstick clicks the pen, loses the track of it. Boomstick clicks the pen way more often, where we get this epic face from Wiz, and it explodes in the conclusion. I feel like the first two should have been switched around. With all this in mind, there has been a criticism saying that the episode in general is very Bond focused, and it's not so dissimilar to the criticism I brought up for Tan Jojo. Tan Jojo? Uh, <laughs> I don't think it's nearly as bad because they at least tried to flesh out Wick and dive deep into his character, whereas they really did not do that with Tanjiro in the slightest. So yeah, I like both analyses, but the writing could have been cleaned up a little. But as for the fight, hmm. When I first got a glimpse of the fight, it had me very concerned. Although the setup was not one of my issues, at least in terms of writing. I think it's amazingly written, and it made me wonder what the fight would have been if it was made during the Torian era. Now, don't mistake me for saying they should have brought Torian back. I have words for the people that unironically meant that sort of thing. Rather, I'm talking about how this setup ties into the old school feeling from the first few seasons. An elaborate setup that feels more like a natural crossover between the two, the two of them being aware of each other in some way, with Bond reference 
referencing Wake as Baba Yaga and Wake knowing about MI6, the overall grounded nature of the fight, and even the score, Secret Service, creating the illusion that it has multiple tracks in the fight. This knife fight especially gives me Snake vs. Sam vibes, and I mean that in the best way. Though I have heard that the fight taking place in the Continental means that both are breaking the rules, since it's meant to be a safe haven for assassins, confirmed by this exchange right here. Killing isn't permitted on company grounds. Lucky me. But I've also heard that Wick would break those rules anyway, and Bond's actual license to kill make him bypass those rules? Eh, they really should have just taken it outside or something. But now we get into the exact thing that made me concerned. This part where Peter Griffin floats in to sing Eye of the Tiger- <clears throat> This part where Bond just floats in to get a drink for John Wick? Yeah, you can tell that these were from completely different eras. And once they start fighting? <sighs> Wick's backhand is so sloppy and makes Bond's gun disappear in one frame, apparently. Bond's weak punch has him leading with his arm instead of his core. Wick slaps Bond with a chair that causes him to spin around in the wrong direction. This plate smash has way too much impact for what's supposed to be just knocking a gun out of Wick's hand, lest we forget the limp arm movements. And while I do like seeing Wick weaponize the remains of the chair he broke, especially since it's likely meant to compensate for his lack of gadgets in comparison to Bond, he's doing that fence punching nonsense. And above all else, it's just painful slow, and I know why it's like that, given the grounded nature of the characters, which is why I think it's more excusable than something like Conrad vs. John, for instance. But at least that episode had functional animations and movements, likely by virtue of it being a sprite episode, sure, but still. And then there's this part where Wick tosses the chair piece at Bond, which disappears for a few frames after he throws it. Yeah, this had me very concerned, and if this was a bottom tier episode for most people, oh, I feel so bad because it would likely de-incentivize Death Battle from doing more live-action movie matchups, or matchups that involve them. Not helped by an episode I'll be talking about later. But thankfully, they have a conversation, and this is where the fight picks up. Yes, the fighting is still slow, but in a way that feels intentional, and even then, Wick's suplex was very impactful, and his punches outright making Bond spin was a cool touch. Though I'm not sure why Bond is using his laser watch to attack something off-screen, but I reckon it was impacted by Wick's tackle holding him in place, and he had to have done something, right? And then there's the pen fight, which is clicked at least 10 times, probably 11 because I think it clicked again after it hit the floor, and then the pen shatters the floor as they fall down. I appreciate them both taking their sweet ass time to get up, demonstrating how these are some of the weaker characters that Death Battle has used. They may be bullet timers, but they ain't surpassing peak human level anytime soon, or at least you wouldn't think that. And this next part of the fight takes what is otherwise a decent episode to a really good one. Bond summons his car, and oh, this is a really good shot. The floor below was fairly dark, so seeing it illuminated by nothing but the car's headlights is so badass. And his entrance coupled with the climax of the track make this one of my favorite moments in the season. Wick shoots Bond's control device, causing the car to spin out of control and keep shooting, and the erratic nature of it makes for a very tense brawl. Like I said, this knife fight is so well done. Fast-paced action, swift movements, strong posing, the car forcing them to be aware of its bullets at all times. Even if it's kind of lame that Bond shrugs off getting stabbed, but to be fair, he was supposed to be bleeding from that. And he does feel the pain later on. But then comes the final shootout, and I believe that the iconic James Bond shot was supposed to communicate the fact that he was shooting through the holes in Wick's bulletproof suit, but either way, I like seeing Wick attempting to power through the remaining bullets, with these slow motion shots demonstrating the pain he's powering through, coupled with some really nice looking facial expressions. Though, that said, wouldn't it have made more sense for Wick to go for a chokehold than to pin his arms to the column? Though, this could also tie in with a point in the conclusion where Bond was equally as skilled of a fighter, so fair enough. And the kill is... decent. I've heard conflicting things about Wick accepting his death at the end, though I think going off of my interpretation of this episode, Wick's bulletproof suit was being worn down throughout the fight, not just with the bullets from the lower deck, but even through a few moments in the beginning, like the initial muzzle flashes and even Bond's cigarette rocket. And as for the ending shot, it's perfect. It demonstrates how Wick's last line of love was officially lost, which was a point brought up in the analysis, in spite of how weird its placement is. And then there's Bond's final pun. <laughs> Smashing. Like how it feels to be smashing the like and subscribe buttons down below. Laugh. I do think that the fight did feel more Bond focused, where he gets to use some of his gadgets while with Wick, despite the fact that he also has plenty of weapons of his own, only uses a pistol, and doesn't use any of his stealth at all, which is really weird. Even if weaponizing everyday objects on the fly, like the chair and even Bond's pen, was meant to compensate, I really do wish he got to use more of his other skill sets. But still, I really like this episode. It may have some semi-annoying issues and a really bad Bond model here and there, but at the end of the day, they got the silk suits and the black ties, so 
as long as they're being represented properly, which Bond assuredly is, and to an extent Wick as well, at least from what I've heard from other people, I don't really need a reason why I should let that hinder my enjoyment of it. So I think I'm gonna give this outing of theirs a 79 out of 100. I'd gladly place it a tier or two higher if the start of the fight was more polished, but when we inevitably see one of these two characters coming back, I reckon people will come running as fast as they can to see the episode, cause at the end of the day, every girl's go crazy about it. had a good arrangement of Marvel vs. DC fights on Death Battle, and Black Adam vs. Apocalypse was the one that got the most amount of people excited. I think I've seen people get more excited for this than every American excited for every presidential election combined. After all, it features Dwayne The Rock Johnson and Apocalypse Marvel Comics X-Men. That's the best star power anything can have, so may the analysis finish appropriately. And if you don't mind, I would like a glass of orange juice over ice, thank you very much. Adam's analysis has a lot of cool story content. His backstory highlights his role as a chosen hero of Kondok, only to also highlight several moments where he wasn't a hero. And of course, there's the ever so iconic Shazoo! Which became a pretty decent running gag, where it got a cute little payoff at the end with Boomstick being adamant and how it's a good catchphrase to a point where he's convinced to try it himself. I didn't expect it to be a running gag, but I'm kinda happy it was one. But unfortunately, there's virtually no versus content here. The most quantifiable thing they go over is the extinction level force field. Kind of. I get what they were going for. They've done so many Marvel and DC characters that there's no point in going by the numbers. And given how often those numbers get compared, you might as well equalize their stats. But skipping ahead a bit, they kind of forgot to give Adam anything remotely comparable to the universal tiers they previously given other DC characters. I mean, sure, I know what Death Battle means when they scale them to their high tiers and top tiers, but let's be real, they have not been super consistent with them in the past, so I can't imagine people who already don't have a lot of knowledge on Marvel and DC high tiers and top tiers to understand what Death Battle means by this. Also, I would have liked them to have covered Adam's friendship with Sinestro, the embodiment of fear. I say this because personally, I don't know that much about Adam, so this would have been nice to know. But as for Apocalypse's analysis, why does Wiz bring up the Bible? Yeah, it gets dark as sh and I can confirm that, but what does this have to do with Apocalypse? The most I can say is that they're vaguely in similar territories, I guess? But like, what's the joke? Uh, uh, let's, let's back up before we get- Aside from that, I think Apocalypse's rundown was better overall. Yeah, there's still a lack of versus content, but it actually works here because they refer to the universal feats as, well, universal. As opposed to just saying he scales to characters who can see a universe. Wow, such a riveting feat. But I really like how his backstory was told. Beginning his story with how his adoptive father, Ball, saw a conqueror in him where only the strong survive, and then by the end of it, Wiz directly says, Ball would be proud. And doesn't just refer to him as Apocalypse, but THE Apocalypse apocalypse himself. Mm, what a beautifully terrifying ending note. Ironic given that everyone views Nur as ugly, but shh. The fight starts off with a comic book aesthetic storytelling of all things. Not sure what took him this long to start doing that now, but I like how it helps sell you on the crossover aspect, emphasized by Adam and Nur already knowing of each other in the fight with all those name drops. You could even argue it's further contextualized with the wisdom of Zahuti telling Adam who he is and Nur being able to read minds. I really hope Death Battle starts normalizing this crossover aspect in their animations, as it's genuinely really cool when it's done well. I mean, it's better than having a, hey, you cut me off, asshats! Am I right? And as for the voice acting, Wolf Williams and Comrade Nikand are great in their roles. Even if Wolf's voice filter makes it hard to hear him on first listen, it's a unique filter that still sounds intimidating. Anyways, that's all my compliments for the fight because I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, I couldn't get into this one. Like, it barely feels like anything substantial is actually happening. They're using their powers, the action is fairly creative, and it's a well-made flying brick fight. Oh. I just realized that's probably the first time I ever said flying brick in this ranking series. Given how a handful of people in the community have a fetish for describing every fight as flying brick for some reason, knowing that there are so many apt terms you could be using instead, like this is probably the first time revisiting any episode where it truly did feel like a flying brick fight to me. Even in episodes I actively find boring, I did not get this feeling, yet I did with the episode that debuted at the Oscar? This fight just has too many issues. 
why does Adam not destroy the Death Seed when it's in his hand? Like, I get that the intent was likely to have Nur prevent Adam from destroying it, but they should have shown him grabbing Adam's arm and then saying his line. And then there's this part where Adam gets dogpiled by Nur's robots, which is weird. I can defend Lex being crushed by rocks because Doom is likely the one controlling them, but I don't think that's the same case here. It feels like Adam is just letting the robots dogpile him, and it's breaking my immersion. Though, to be fair, it does lead into the godlike fear exchange, where Nur is saying that his kind, meaning the people of Kondok, will learn to feel apocalypse, yet Adam is saying that he is single-handedly more intimidating than every kind of threat apocalypse can be, and given how the yellow lantern ring is supposed to be powered by fear, it makes this such a raw exchange and easily my favorite part of the episode. But then it cuts from explosion to them standing still and then it feels like there needed another shot. I guess maybe there wasn't enough time or maybe a transition wouldn't have worked as well as I think it would have. And even when they start fighting, it plays weird flapping noises for some reason and they just suddenly break the moon. I mean, yeah, the moon has nice sound design, but the rushdown attacks really don't. They feel less impactful than the rushdown attacks from season one. And then you have the tiger pushing Nur through his robot army, forcing him to absorb them so he can grow in size and eclipse the entirety of Kondok. But then Adam is so unfazed by it that he just charges right at him anyway with a peculiar yet badass line. Then it leads into the fight against Kaiju Apocalypse, and it's kind of dull. Adam just zips around Nur's arm for no reason and gets swatted out of the air in one punch. And while it's cool to see him going for one last attack, it's so limp with really bad sound design, and not even this big explosion makes sense because the very next shot looks like nothing was being exploded. And then we get into the death, and I like the idea of it. And it's mostly executed well enough. Nur shows how much of an Adele fan he is, and seeing Adam all bloodied and beaten, being forced to watch Conduct burn to ash just before he's disintegrated by what is essentially his own power, and then after he dies, he's just tossed away as if he's a piece of trash. This whole sequence is just so vicious. However, Adam choosing to stay down to drop a quirky one-liner feels out of character and directly contradicts the analysis saying that he'll always get back up. And why does Nur stomp crack the screen? It's really not that fun of a visual gag because nothing is done with it aside from, I guess, Wiz being covered in the conclusion at one point? I don't know, I just don't find the cohesion in this. Or maybe it's meant to be a symbolic thing as if everything Adam has built is not only set to fall but also broken, but it didn't need to linger in the conclusion. And it doesn't change the fact that it's still a weird artistic choice in general. And as for the track, Fallen Gods, it's honestly my least favorite rap track in the series. It's still good though, for the same reasons I like Kings of Infinity. Rap's commanding presence fits perfectly for these two, and Omega Sparks' and SWAT's venomous voices accentuate the tone even further. And what makes it more impressive is that the instrumental doesn't enhance the scenes too much. It's entirely done by the increased dynamics and energy of the vocals. It's just the lyrics, man. Look, we've all memed them to death, but it doesn't change the fact fact that, why? Overall, I'm sorry, but I couldn't really get into this one. Revisiting this season has been full of surprises for me because I was able to gain a massive appreciation and respect for episodes I didn't think I would get any from, like a certain god that I'll be covering later. And I was hoping that the same thing would happen here, but it's just okay at best. 63 out of 100. I'm sorry guys, but this episode was not worth dressing up for. Driven from the world that <laughs> Okay, okay, what was that voice crack I just did? <laughs> okay, I know that Trunks vs. Silver has always been a popular match, and there are people who still want to see the original version of Trunks and Silver fighting one another for some reason, but I could never get invested in this matchup. I know why it's popular. It works thematically, but I just can't bring myself to enjoy the vast majority of Dragon Ball vs. Sonic matchups knowing what stemmed the series comparison in the first place, with this matchup especially embodying how toxic the comparison could get. So when this episode was teased, I was not looking forward to it. But then come the next time trailer and... Heroes? Archie Sonic? Hmm. I mean, yeah, it's still Trunks vs. Silver, but both of these versions have so many unique abilities that they could not do in the original anime manga and games respectively, which makes the debate way more complex than you might think. More on that later. So the two week waiting period, for me at least, was a lot of fun anticipating, and I never thought I would be saying that with a matchup like this. And honestly, this is probably the season 9 episode I revisit the most, at least in terms of the fight. But I'm interested in seeing what these analyses are. Everyone knows Trunks is the coolest dragon.
Dragon Ball character. No, that's Hercule Satan and you know it. Trunks is kind of lame. Don't lie. I've never told a lie, Boomy. People have historically ragged on Silver for being like the third, maybe fourth Sonic recolor, but Trunks is literally the seventh Goku with nothing to stand out aside from a basic ass sword. And yeah, swords are cool, but this one still gets ratioed by every half decently powerful sword in every anime and game. And like Trunks has no personality and talks like a discount wannabe filthy Frank. What's so cool about him aside from nothing? This whole bit is supposed to be a joke, by the way. I don't actually hate Trunks that much. I will say he definitely deserved a better analysis, even if this was supposed to cover Xenoverse slash Dragon Ball heroes. I still think it's a very in-depth and well-written summary of heroes and its differences from the normal Dragon Ball timeline, and it also covers a few of his unique abilities and name drops multiple exclusive characters from the series, which was cool. But this whole analysis is a lot like Bucky O'Hare's rundown, where if you're gonna shill a character and try to convince me into thinking that he's the coolest character in fiction, try actually talking about the character beyond his powers and bare minimum responsibilities. I can see this as being a tough writing job because they had to talk about a separate Dragon Ball continuity as well as a different version of a character that hasn't been on the show before. But if this was supposed to be so much different than the normal version of Trunks, why is there hardly any expansion on his character or even the differences in them? After all, there are other Dragon Balls I dislike or at least don't care for, but was still able to get invested just by hearing Death Battle talk about them in depth because I get to hear about the character, not their functions. So while I still enjoyed this analysis and hearing about how its powers work, it leaves a lot to be desired in terms of story and nuance. That being said, Silver's analysis fixes that problem exactly how I wanted it to, properly elaborating on his powers and the differences from his video game counterpart. Heck, they even made telekinesis sound badass. One of the most boring powers to talk about if you really think about it, given its lack of proper weaknesses. How the hell do you do that? I, I really can't explain how it happened, but they did it. <laughs> It's almost like Ultra Guy is an underrated writer or something. Plus, they cover other things like Archie Sonic's cosmology, the canonicity to Sonic 06, Silver's life as a student of Mammoth Mogul, and the craziness of Archie Sonic's feats. The last one of which was handled much better because they don't meander on the less impressive feats. Although something that stood out to me was that they reused the Sonic moving and stop time feat from that episode. It's almost word for word. Let me repeat that. Time was frozen and he could still move. Let me say that again. Time was frozen, and Sonic could still move. What the hell? Even the black box is the near exact same. Like, dog, why? <laughs> I mean, it does have some minor problems, like the whole, LOL, Sonic has too many characters. And Boomstick also says gross after he says Mogul and Silver did tons of research. The context was supposed to be over the time stones, right? What's gross about that? Boomstick being in utter shock over the crossover between Sonic and Spawn was pretty funny in a way. And they also mentioned Silver's dorky side in a respectful way, saying he's not the sharpest quill on the hog. Interesting word choice. But they're saying this in the context of how his mission needs him to understand the entire multiverse, which they outright say is complicated. Multiple times. And they even ended with how Silver was renowned as a hero anyway. And the editing is also very, very good, with special highlights to Silver's psychokinesis panel with that wavy lightning effect, and Sonic Man's time stop feat with that clean finger snap. And the way that the text disappears as well, mm, that's so sick. And just like in Zawanda, Jocelyn is here to explain some of the more complex stuff, proving my point that this is how she's best utilized in death battle. This ain't a diss at future episodes or anything. They genuinely stick with this and it proves my point that it works best this way. But then we get into the fight. Okay. This is the most hyped I have ever been watching a Death Battle episode on my first watch. Probably the only one I willingly rewatched before giving it a proper analysis. I adore this fight so much! I mean, the start is kind of whatever. It's an adequate setup with some amazing looking 3D objects, but these sword swings are a little stiff. They're really trying to bridge the gap between sprites and 3D. Maybe it's because Silver never actually touches the objects, so they add to the immersion by default, but even without that, the greenish aura the objects have when Silver throws them makes the 3D objects look 2D. Even in Magneto vs. Tetsuo, it wasn't quite done this well. Hell, in this shot, some objects in the background layer are sprites, likely to make the rendering process easier because I cannot imagine it being straightforward, but I didn't even notice that these were sprites at first. They blend in so well, and that's to say nothing of
of the actual 2D effects, like these wind slash effects on Trunks Masenko, which is otherwise just a white line, but look at how much it adds to its fluidity and speed. And when Silver redirects other key blasts, look at how clean the curvature is. But as for other parts of the fight, I will admit I don't like the first transformation too much. I mean, I like the idea of Silver's transformation alone destroying the meteor that he built, but aside from that, Trunks' delayed transformation after the meteor crashes into him is kind of lame, and when they cut to Silver, it's a hard cut to what is essentially a bunch of static frames back to back. And Silver's first It's No Use is also kind of underwhelming. I know why it's here, it gets a callback later on, but I feel like it comes a bit too early. I would have had Silver doing at least a couple of more redirects and then drop the line. But if nothing else, the ripoff line is cute. It's a reference to another Dragon Ball vs. Sonic episode, this time featuring Vegeta's son, who was also voiced by a Dragon Ball Z abridged voice actor. And yeah, as you can imagine, Kaiser Nico as Trunks makes the character sound actually cool. Scott's Trunks is just a much better take on the character than his official voice actor. Though I'm aware that people have passionately volatile opinions on the Team 4 Star voice actors, but I just think that they're talented regardless of what characters they're voicing. It's not that deep. But as for Silver's voice, bro, I cannot believe that they got the Cat Noir to voice the character. That is so based. I don't even like Miraculous Ladybug that much, but it is so based. It's almost like Sega should hire this guy. <laughs> But I will say, while I think the transformation itself is limp, I think that they make the Super Saiyan form look awesome. God bless Origin the Pogchamp for his top tier custom sprite designs. And once they go into space, <clears throat> this is where the fight starts getting impeccable. You have Silver blowing up the moon and weaponizing its pieces, and then Trunks relying on Gacha. Cringe. Okay, in all seriousness, it's still a fun gag. Though what's not cringe is his Super Saiyan God transformation. His Gallic Gun gets redirected, and his sword gets shattered, but he just powers through the beam, turns it into a mesmerizing red, and punches Silver in the face, leading into what is apparently a Xenoverse combo. And then the impacts of the final flash? Sure, it's not as good as Vegeta's, but it still has the same sense of scale, and the colors look beautiful. They even edit the music just to help it pop more. <laughs> And they didn't need to do that because Hedge of Tomorrow is so fucking good! Best track of the season, free. Non-stop energy and top-tier lyrics from Logan Adams. I don't think it would feel out of place in Sonic Frontiers. Or Subspace Emissary if you catch my drift. Hey. And then Trunks brings out the key sword with a badass line, and then he cleaves Silver, which distorts all of reality. The sound effects are scratchy, the moon is jittering even though Silver destroyed it, and even the screen itself can't seem to keep still. It's a lot like that one oddity from Beast vs. Goliath where the screen seemed to be leaving its own aspect ratio, but here it had to have been intentional. I can't imagine otherwise. And then it forces Silver to use Chrono's control, and Trunks respond with the Eternal Time Labyrinth. One clearly has a better delivery, but I would wouldn't be surprised if it needed to be shorter and faster, so no harm, no foul. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is the first time the Eternal Time Labyrinth has ever been in an animation, and they make it look stunning. From the glowing blue chains to the various crystals, filled with some epic references to other time travelers, which includes Hal Jordan but not Alien X, so I'm pretty sure that's a message to some of y'all. And then we get my two favorite lines of the episode back to back. In fact, let's just break this whole scene down. This is it, Time Hog! When he starts dashing towards Silver, you may notice that Trunks is just a sad little head in this shot. But much like with Jack vs. Afro, or Skullgirls, this makes a lot more sense in context of the animation. Not only is it meant to convey the sword's sense of speed, but the turnaround it does. Take a look at how much it adds to the movement here. And then Silver drops this. I told you. As mentioned earlier, it's supposed to be the payoff to the it's no use from the beginning of the fight. And here, it really hammers in how Silver was able to just Uno reverse card Trunks' stronger attacks. This episode's words, not mine. Seeing Silver do it on Trunks' final attack makes this such an epic power move. Also, can we talk about how they gave a spin dash sound effect the impact of a f***ing supernova? But even though this is supposed to be the killing blow, Trunks doesn't give up as he just manhandles that sword of his, and Silver has to put effort into 
squishing it inside of him, causing his entire body to distort, like what happened with the key sword earlier, and then be deleted from the face of existence. And then Silver just teleports and says nothing. Some people have a problem with this for some reason, but like, what did you want him to say? He already had a quirky one-liner. Did you want him to say another one? Why would you want him to break the viewer's immersion? But yeah, holy crap, this fight was so good! I can't wait to hear what Ian Flynn has to say about- Oh. Right. He did respond. I think we need to talk about this, because I feel like I'm gonna get a lot of people telling me about this if I don't. Shortly after this episode premiered, many people started talking to Ian Flynn about this, with one of them getting a response that said that Ian Flynn personally disagrees with the outcome. Which was almost instantly followed up by two different tweets where he basically says that it's not worth arguing because versus debating is subjective. But either way, I feel like this whole thing is just being blown out of proportion. If an author or writer disagrees with a death battle episode, that is not the dunk you think it is. It's just exactly what it is. Nothing more, nothing less. And if you really want to take everything a writer says at face value, then I hope you're consistent in automatically believing all of the garbled nonsense that Turf K. Rowling has said about the Harry Potter series. Also, are we just gonna ignore the part where he directly comments complimented Kaiser Nico for his performance in this episode? Oh, whatever, we can be cringe for today. This is also a big reason why I'm getting sick and tired of seeing that Stan Lee quote everywhere I go. Not because it's a bad quote or that I disagree with it or anything, but there are way too many people taking the piss out of it for what I can only assume to be for no real reason. Even if you ignore the fact that he was never once referring to power scaling at any point in the history of ever, and even if you ignore the fact that he was referring to characters that he writes in his stories for narrative purposes, and even if you ignore how there are plenty of other writers that do take power scaling into account, like the biggest mangaka in history, the underlying message of this was that the question of who would win in a fight is not something that matters to him. And there are so many writers who are like this. People say that this is supposedly meant to be going against the writer's vision, but like, how do you know that? There have been several writers, authors, creators, etc. that know about death battle and know about their characters having been used, and they tend to be totally fine with the stuff they bring up. And even if they have problems with it or disagree with the outcome, they never once express any beef with it. I know that this quote is also used to tell people not to take death battle so seriously, but if that's your endgame, then just say that people shouldn't be taking death battle seriously. Like, the wording is right there. No need to blatantly take a one-off quote out of context from somebody who's been dead for years as a means of downplaying a simple hobby, as well as harassing people who are casually partaking in said hobby. You do realize that being an idiot in public is optional, right? Likewise, this whole Ian Flynn situation is the same way. He's speaking from a general narrative perspective, and not Death Battle's giving them everything they've ever had that is viable approach. Although yes, I am aware with the disagreement he does have about the Super Genesis wave, but not only does Ultra Guy say it did, but the episode did as well. Not just with this black box right here, but also with this direct statement that is said out loud in the analysis. Despite being able to rewrite even the extra-dimensional chaos force from whence it came, Normalize paying attention to the analyses, people. It's okay. I mean, none of this changes the fact that he still disagrees with the outcome, but that's perfectly okay. Unlike the people who tried to gaslight Ian Flynn into thinking he didn't even know his own writing. You realize being an idiot in public is optional, right? But contrary to popular belief, the Death Battle team is totally cool with people disagreeing with their episodes. I mean, yes, they used to be all high and mighty and would often pretend that their episodes were objective, but they've long since gotten over that. Heck, even I as a longtime fan of the show disagree with their episodes every once in a while. I bring up this tangent not because I disagree with Ian Flynn, but honestly, even ignoring all of that, this is probably one of, if not the single episode, where I can not only understand why people would disagree with it, but I also think their interpretation interpretation of the fight is 100% valid and correct. This matchup is so complex and has so many factors. Many people, myself included, have referred to this matchup as interpretation incarnate. And if you don't believe me, all you have to do is go to the G1 blog and check out the over 7,500 word verdict just for trunks. To put that into perspective, that is almost twice as many words as the verdicts for both Scarlet Witch and Zatanna combined. Which is another super convoluted and debatable matchup that directly takes cosmology into account. It's insane! With that said, Death Battle still has their own interpretation, so let's break down what it's meant to be, as I reckon that some people have been confused by it. Their first point is that time travel wasn't much of a factor. You know, basically like what they did with Goku Black vs. Reverse Flash, where this came down to stats and abilities. Yeah, I agree. And their second point is that Silver could disable Trunks' tech and redirect his energy attacks while also being able to resist Trunks' key sword. Yep, I did hear about this, and even the people who were rooting and betting for Trunks did say that this could have been a factor. Although there are people who say that Silver was able to block the key, which, um, no. 
No, he was not able to block the key. Did you not see him getting knocked out by the final flash? Why is this criticism a thing? Uh, whatever, whatever. Their third point is that Trunks' speed is finite, while Superforms in Archie comics have shown multiple infinite and immeasurable speeds. I mean, there are arguments for immeasurable Dragon Ball, and Death Battle itself has directly confirmed that they agree with this in Goku vs. Superman 2023, and Ultra Guy has always believed that they have merit. So I guess you could interpret this as Archie Superforms have shown these speeds more consistently. Totally up for debate, but it's definitely reasonable. But then there's this final point, and Death Battle says that this is the most imperative factor of their verdict. While Trunks' maximum power is of an infinite multiverse, Silver's maximum potential is infinitely more infinite because Archie's sonic cosmology go wee! That's one hell of an interpretation, not gonna lie, Wiz. Okay, but in all seriousness, this is absolutely an improvement over Wally vs. Archie Sonic. Not a single second feels like it was wasted. It's just that when you break down what their argument is meant to be, it's just really funny saying it out loud. But I mean, if you're still salty over Silver beating Trunks, I mean, if it means anything, Trunks has taken nothing but Ws in every other versus show in existence, so I can't imagine one single L could be that bad, right? Especially since Dragon Ball does have the second biggest win streak on Death Battle behind DC Comics, albeit it was more spread out in comparison, sure, but the win streak is still there. Not to mention, none of the Dragon Ball episodes in Death Battle have been bad, except for that one, I guess. But this one is totally one of my favorites, and no, it's not because my preferred character won. Okay, it kind of is, I'm definitely biased, and you are gonna be okay with it. But I would still hold this episode in high regard even if Trunks won. Honestly, I even thought that the DBX was solid and it had my preferred character losing. But for the official Death Battle with their video game and comic book, counterparts, I think I'll give it a 91 out of 100. And seeing Silver win was also kind of a little victory for me. Cringy, I know, but life as a Silver fan was hard. So let me have this when I'm about to say this one last thing as I gather up all the hormone I can muster. <sighs> Trunks isn't that good of a character. Anyways, next episode, let's go. Wait a minute, this ain't Sauron versus Sauron. What the heck is Spongy Babaru doing on Delta Batoru? And he's fighting Aquaman? Wait, a super friend? Oh! Oh! Wait, why'd I get excited? Well, there's a reason for that, and uh... Yo, Carrick, I'm gonna have to borrow your video real quick, because, um... Be honest, has anyone here actually seen the entirety of Super Friends before this episode was announced? That's right, braggers. Not only did I watch every season of Super Friends, but it was actually my introduction to the DC franchise. And I grew up with SpongeBob alongside it, so I was actually super excited to see this one. Seeing Death Battle covering Super Friends and just generally seeing them cover SpongeBob from a versus standpoint alone meant that this was gonna be comedy gold. Speaking as like the only Super Friends fan in the versus community, I might as well address one of the common criticisms this episode has gotten. They downplay Super Friends Aquaman so much despite supposedly supposedly not being that weak. While yes, that is true, at the end of the day, none of this matters because he is fighting SpongeBob. I am at minimum a large planet level Toon Force God, SquarePants. Although there are those people that claim that the disrespect to our Super Friends Aquaman retroactively makes comic book Aquaman look lame. We've covered Arthur Curry on the show before and he's actually secretly awesome. The version we're dealing with today is from the bargain bin cartoons from the 60s and 70s. And he's the king of Atlantis too. Oh wait, no, it says here that was introduced in the comics later. Can even control people's minds and give them seizures, right? Oh, uh, actually, that second part is also just from the comics. This Aquaman comes from a time when everybody who's anybody had their own secret cave with assorted gadgets. Well, that criticism's already been debunked. Seriously, why was it ever a thing? Oh wait, it's a moral issue for some reason. Guys, stop trying to stand on your own morals and claim you're higher than other people. You're just gonna fall off the moment somebody asks you a simple question. Whatever, just to get that one nonsensical thing out of the way, SpongeBob's analysis can be summed up in one word. Asexual- Absolutely based to hear Boomstick saying that. The rest of the analysis was decent. I really like the dynamic of the analyses where Wiz is rooting for Aquaman because he thinks Bob is weak, and Boomstick is a big fan of his show. But then Wiz completely changes his mind on both accounts. I think the only major problem with this episode is the seasonal rot tangent that Boomstick makes out of nowhere. I grew up in early 2010s media, so I heard nothing but seasonal rot SpongeBob throughout about a decade. 
pretty much. But otherwise, yeah, I thought this was a pretty funny analysis. The joke of SpongeBob being a quote unquote God in the versus debater scene is kind of old, but that's not Death Battle's fault. That's just generally lol cartoons are gods or whatnot. They can be Goku or something. You've heard this before. I've heard this before. This analysis does play around with that joke sufficiently enough. In general, Wiz is at his peak in this episode with how much energy he's giving, conveying how analyzing SpongeBob SquarePants broke him. I can imagine Wiz being like this. Plus there's also Doodle Wiz and the opening spiel is a fan theory or at least a reference to one, but I'm not docking points from it. If anything, I'm adding to it since this is a joke episode. So like, yeah, why not? Just pretend that this is supposed to be serious. <laughs> Aquaman's rundown follows the joke pretty well. Boomstick is actually open to his capabilities and- That's right, Boomstick. He did it, boys! He said it! A lot of people see this analysis as them blatantly disrespecting Super Friends Aquaman, but I recently came up with a different interpretation. Like, they start off making him try to sound cool, saying that he's a little different from the regular Aquaman, but he's still got some cool stuff. But then they start listing his feats, which are nowhere near as impressive as what they gave Spongy Boy, and they come to that realization pretty quickly. And this causes Wiz to be more desperate in trying to find impressive feats for Super Friends Aquaman. And at first, he starts off pretty well, giving him a billion C speed feat, and and in general, I'd argue that they're not disrespecting him at all. Like, the joke is how they thought they could get away with doing another Wally vs. Sonic or Trunks vs. Silver situation. They go in thinking that it would be the Sponge Guy vs. a DC Herald, with a fun cartoon and campy superhero vibe to it, that utilizes a lot of Toon Force and creativity. They even say this at the end of SpongeBob's preview. What better way to fight a cartoon than with another cartoon? And especially one from an era where superheroes could do basically anything they wanted. Obviously, it was gonna get cut from the episode, but with this in mind, I found the joke to be that they realized they made a complete mismatch and it was too late to change it. This is why they have Boomstick saying, Gonna die here. Because it's supposed to be more of a nod to how Death Battle goes into an episode thinking that the matchup is gonna be close, or that the other character is gonna win, only for their perspective to completely change partway through, which has happened a lot more than you might think. And even the way that they splice Boomstick's voice clip during the interlude as if he was cutting himself off? I mean, I've certainly done that before a few times, so I found it really funny. The only problem I do have with this analysis is that they just outright insult Super Friends for no reason. Like, if it was just a one-off comment like with the Bargain Bin DVD line, I'd be okay with it, but here they just randomly feel like dedicating a good portion of time to insulting it. Not a huge deal, but at the same time, you unironically gave MK11's retcon of Twin Del <coughs> of Sindel more respect than Super Friends during a time period where the heat was at its highest. Don't do this. And then we get into the fight. I have more to say about it than you might think. Aside from the out of place battle for bikini bottom sprites, the first half has exactly what I wanted from this episode. Spingo Blab mistaking Aquaman for Mermaid Man and still getting his name wrong, the city being destroyed with Bunge Spob's complete obliviousness to it, and action reminiscent of those fun and campy 50s and 60s superhero series. You know, like, uh, Super Friends, for instance. And even the track has a reference to Sam Spencer's Line Man theme. I mean, yeah, it does do the whole city is in complete panic and is randomly fine in the next shot, but that kind of thing happens in Ween. Bob all the time. If anything, it adds quite a bit to the comedy of the scene. It has a lot of fun references to Sponge Cake Brown Pants' show. I don't think I need to explain them all, as I'm sure most people can recognize them right away. They're well implemented, and they still manage to fit in some original jokes as well. Like when they're hitting each other with these comic effects. Even the sterility. <laughs> yeah. And seeing Aquaman get got punched with the bubble missile. And then Aquaman starts getting some meaningful hits in the fight, which is nice. I mean, yeah, Spinge Bill outright no-sells it, but I like how they still play it up as a big moment for him, given that it's the only real hit he gets in the fight. And overall, the first half is exactly what I would have wanted from this episode. But then we get to the second half, and I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. Aquaman's breakdown is my least favorite scene of the season. I don't mind the portal too much. I've heard that they're meant to be a reference to the Nicktoons Unite series, and I can also buy Aquaman being able to see other versions of himself. Maybe this is just me going off of my interpretation, but what is making him break down here? I understand that the joke is supposed to be that Super Friends Aquaman is not as cool as Wiz and Boomstick thought he would be, and I can understand why they try and work it into the animation. And you could also argue that this is supposed to be a similarity between the two characters where they're both seen as losers, be it from the citizens in their world or just from general people. People. But at the same time, how does he instantly know he's the lamest one? 
I think the way I would have done it would have been to have had a crowd of fish people yelling at Aquaman and tearing away at his pride. Crowds of fish people have often been used to advance a plot in other episodes, so it wouldn't feel too out of the ordinary for them to start saying, you're the lamest Aquaman, Mermaid Man is cooler than you, or something like that. And then the rest of the scene could play out like normal. SpongeBuck's speech would feel properly earned because it's in a more specific position that he's been in himself before. But I can imagine that this would also have required the animation team to have made a lot of assets for what I honestly think would amount to like a 10 second scene at most, so I can understand if there was no time for that. So if it had to be the portals, just showing a scene from Aquaman vs. Namor would have worked way better than this. I will admit that it's kind of funny how Aquaman's tears essentially give him his powers back, but otherwise, this is character assassination. No way around it. Now, I can usually accept an episode having a combatant acting out of character because they need a reason to fight, or that's just death battle for you. But this is character assassination for the sake of some meta-narrative that none of the characters are aware of, and I can't imagine death battle would ever go for a dramatic irony approach to an episode like this. And even then, during Spring Boob's Heart to Heart, Tom Shock is my goat, but this is where it really starts to fall off for me. I wouldn't say this is a bad impression, as I thought he was doing a great job in the beginning, nailing his mannerisms, the laugh, and even the karate! But this is where his impression really starts to fall off, as he's just going into a generic nerd voice that I've heard him say in some one-off comic dubs. Though I will say Keston Howard's Aquaman is consistently charming throughout. And on top of that, Aquaman goes for a stab with a trident. Dick move, man. Dick move. Although I do like his May the Best Hero win line, which was not only meant as a callback from earlier, but this single-handedly turns the fight into a fun sparring match, and I like this change in shift. Plus, the episode from here on out stays pretty good. It has some alright action, functional animations, a doodlebob army, and Aquaman drawing a door that leads to the other side of the universe. That was a weak impression of the narrator, not gonna lie, Liam. And then Tom's I'm ready line is decent, but it could have been better. And this is where Keston Howard starts giving it his all as Aquaman. And also it's really funny how the final clash is higher in scale than everything in Thor vs. Vegeta. It even manages to jump scare bootleg boy's fourth wall awareness! But then there's the emotional ending, and I'm sorry, but it doesn't really do much for me. It technically works, but not for me. Certainly not after the whole meta-narrative nonsense. Though I do like the Ocean Man reference as payoff to Spinge Binge mispronouncing Aquaman. I'll admit, in spite of my problems with the episode, this never fails to make me smile. It's cute. But does we say this was an extremely close match? This was an incredibly close fight. LET'S GO! Yeah, contrary to popular belief, you can have problems with this episode without feeling the need to call an insult. Speaking as a Super Friends fan, yes, I would have liked to have seen more campiness reminiscent of it, but at the same time, I can confirm Aquaman in that show was f***ing lame! And I was especially not happy with that one season that randomly felt like axing The Flash and Green Lantern, yet they kept Aquaman around, despite doing virtually nothing with him ever. He does not need this massive defense force so there's no reason to gaslight yourself into pretending to care about a character- Actually, no! Pretending to care about a version of a character that I am 99.9% .9 certain you had no familiarity with. If I can get over Ragnar vs. Soul, I fail to see why you can't get over this episode. Just a thought. But still, I do wish I could enjoy this episode more, but hey, a 68 out of 100 is not the worst score at all. That's a lot lower than what most fans of the episode would give it, but I think I've made my unique stance perfectly clear, so I hope that we can agree to disagree. But at the end of the day, I still like this idea infinitely more than Spongebob vs. Gumball- <laughs> I'm actually really excited to talk about Jason vs. Michael. This was the episode I was the most interested in revisiting. Not to say I was the most excited to revisit it, but there are people who passionately hate this episode, and I just not realize that it's always passionate hatred when it comes to these death battle episodes. Can't it just be civil one time? Uh, well, this is the United States of whatever, so okay. Just like with Shadow vs. Ryuko, I felt like I needed to check out some of these horror films to get an idea of it. And when my brother came over for a visit, we actually checked out quite a few horror films we missed out on. Films like The Craft, Signs, I Know What You Did Last Summer, and of course, the first four Friday the 13th films. 
I wasn't able to check out any of the Halloween films, but I can say I got enjoyment out of these. They're really cool, cheesy, but still cool, and a lot of the scares really work for me. Though that said, I cannot believe that digital tie was the one who gave Jason his iconic mask. And this was probably the one time where I was actively checking out other opinions of this episode very frequently. I mean, I would do that on occasion if I needed to figure out how to word one of my points, as well as check out other people's problems and praises and see how much I can disagree with them. But with this one, let's just say I got some takes on this episode. Let's start with the analysis. Both analyses are hella immersive, especially Jason's. And it's not just because of the campfire story vibe, but because Wiz and Boomstick maintain these dramatic effects in their voices the entire time. The only time when they drop it being the teleporting argument. Which makes sense because it's a genuine argument that people have had in the series before. And then you have the cutaway gag where Dummy loses his eyesight and then gets picked off, and the joke got me laughing, which is a rarity for these cutaway gags. And it never detracts from my immersion because the joke begins in their dramatic voices, and it isn't until Wiz does the whole, well, actually, bit where it starts to become a debate. And even then, they still mention how his supposed teleportation allows him to pick off his victims one by one, which happens to Dummy shortly after they bring it up. The only specific complaint I have with Jason's analysis is that they rush into the ending notes a bit too quickly, where they bring up other killers he's fought and then instantly going into a warning for Jason. It just doesn't flow very well to me. Though I like how they show a few frames of Jason's eye just before the ending transition. I usually can't stand these types of editing errors, but given the horror vibe as well as Jason's presence in his movies, to me it felt intentional. And then opening the doors to begin Michael's analysis, yep, it's also really good. The cutaway wasn't as funny, and is kind of inconsistent with Jocelyn's general portrayal as being disinterested, but she is one to flex her knowledge of obscure trivia, so I can ignore it. I also really like how the rundown paints Michael as a complete mystery. Kind of like Jason, where the mystery is how he keeps coming back, which Michael also has, but more in the sense of not knowing why Michael became the way he is. And when they realize they never figured out why, they cover his shockingly high intelligence, be it how he taught himself how to drive or how he knows exactly how to kill someone quickly or slowly. I found Michael's rundown more immersive than Jason's, which I mean in the best way without downplaying either one. Although the jokes here aren't as funny, but the ending note flows a lot better. There are complaints about how there's not a lot of verses in this versed show, but to me it's only a problem in the conclusion, and I'll get there when I get there. Then we get into the fight, and I know there are a lot of opinions, but personally, I think that the start of the fight is sublime. The atmosphere is perfect with the dark lighting and- wait, was that a scratchy film gradient in the sky? Ooh! Along with Pamela's speech referencing the first Halloween film? Even if I would have preferred her voice to sound older like in the movies, but whatever, whatever. This is really good and honestly, parts of this scene almost make it look live action. No, I'm serious. When I saw the sneak peek, I genuinely thought they were doing this in live action. Even though they already confirmed it was going to be in 3D, but uh, counterpoint, Shut up. I can even overlook the stock scream. I'm never taken out of it, especially with Michael's POV shot, Jason coming out of the fog with that intense string noise from the score, and Michael suddenly coming at him from behind. This left a powerful first impression. And then they start fighting, and on the one hand, yeah, their animations are a little too fast in what's supposed to be a fight between two killers with heavy lethargic movements, which make moments like Jason smacking Michael with the corpse feel too sudden and weightless, even if I like the concept. But on the other hand, I'm actually not bothered by the shaky cam. I don't think it makes the fight tough to see at all. If anything, it makes the action more engaging, at least for me. It's always going back and forth naturally between each attack. Camera focuses on Jason during his attack, then the camera moves to Michael and focuses on him dodging it, and then it moves to highlight the next attack. You get the idea. The storyboards generally make the action way clearer than the animation does admittedly, but it's still not impossible for me to tell what's going on here. And it makes the sudden stop with Michael's finishing blow all the more jarring, especially with the music cues lining up with Michael's stab pinning Jason to a tree, even if the sound effect is out of sync, but I really don't mind the jank here. Not to mention that their attacks are still fairly frantic too, which is something I'd expect from these monsters, or at least from Jason. Michael definitely has more intelligence on his side, and it is conveyed pretty well with his previously mentioned dodge and act of pinning Jason to a tree, trying to get him to stay dead. But then we get to the most hated aspect of this entire animation. This is Derek Derrickman. What's that? He's credited as Joe Victim? Uh, his name is Derek Derrickman. Wait, what's that? His name is actually Sam? Counterpoint, his name is Derek Derrickman. Oh, wait, 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 wait. He's modeled after Brandon Wilson, aka Bugsy, from the Friday the 13th game. His name is 
Derek, Derek, man! I've heard both people defending this by saying it's supposed to convey the aspects of how horror movies focus on the human characters that die in the movies, and I've also heard people criticizing it by how it focuses on the citizens that no one cares about when they just want to see the monsters fighting. And, uh, hot take of the night, or at least I think this is a hot take of the night, like, I'm not sure what the horror community would think about this, but, uh, yes, you do care about them. Let me explain, let me explain. Keep in mind this is coming from someone who recently got into these movies, but the characters that people supposedly don't care about, I found myself caring about them to an extent. Obviously none of them are meant to be complex characters, but they're at least fleshed out enough to where maybe you wouldn't want to live in the same house with them, but you could have a nice time grabbing a bear with them and shooting the breeze. So when they start getting picked off one by one, that's when I start to care because, oh no, this character that I just spent a good chunk of the film learning about just died. But in the context, of a three minute death battle fight, or apparently two and a half minute death battle fight, we know nothing about Derek Derrickman. That's why when he dies, it's not shocking at all, because the animation is just not built for fleshing out these bystanders. Who is he? What's his personality like? What does he normally do? What's his relationship with this Alex person? I do believe this is the biggest problem with the fight, but at the same time, I do think this criticism is also semi-overblown in a way. Some people might see this as a stain that spits in the face of a matchup they really like. I see this as an episode that has some really cool ideas that just needed some more creative execution or at least some finer tuning. If the goal was to have the fight take place from Derek Derrickman's perspective, then this POV shot of him should have had a scene of Jason and Michael fighting. And then it could also feature something like Jason knocking Michael out of the way, making Derek Derrickman think that he has a chance to escape, only to have Michael appear out of nowhere and then hit him with the act, which by the way, should have at least knocked him out. There is no reason he could have survived that, I'm sorry. Or with that knife thing, you could just have Jason appearing right in front of him just before he gets to the car. Which, uh, speaking of which, this is probably the one time where I think this idea was handled pretty well. The car not starting has been a thing that's happened multiple times in the Friday the 13th movies, at least the ones I've seen, and it helps Jason maintain his constant presence, where it's framed in a way where you'd think that's Michael coming at him, but nope, it was Jason the whole time. But even then, it does have this issue where it hard cuts from Derek Derrickman being knocked through the car to instantly being choked by Jason. And if it really mattered that he had to survive an axe being sliced in his back, Derek Derrickman should have died here. Be it through the choke, or better yet, have Jason flip the car onto Michael, thereby indirectly killing Derek Derrick- Okay, maybe the animation was never gonna include that. But then after that, we get this fight in the graveyard, and I actually think it's really cool. There's this shot of Jason catching the axe in his hands, which, yeah, it's limp, but still a cool moment, with his unflinching body not even moving from it. And then Michael dazes Jason with a tombstone that knocks him to the floor and tries stomping on his back, pushing him towards the axe. I actually think this is better than the version from the storyboards. I mean, I guess it does contextualize why Michael is just standing behind him, but having Michael being the daddy that steps on him seems like it would have more impact and force behind it, especially given the vulnerable position that Jason's already in. And then we see Pamela's grave, which motivates Jason to continue, highlighted by this shot into Jason's eye. Plus, the model uses his design from Friday the 13th Part 3, and given that he was technically still human during that time, at least in a way, this is a literal window into his humanity human self. Really nice cinematography there. And then Jason gets dazed again, this time by a knife going through his head, but then he jams the axe in Michael's head, decapitates him with the wrong end of Michael's weapon, but he slams it on Pamela's tombstone, chopping his head in two. Perfectly brutal in a way I would have wanted it to, even if this 15 second long shot is unnecessary. But I like how this whole fight works with the music. It's not something I'd listen to on its own, but it's not that kind of track. Therewolf made a behind the scenes video for it that shows how he was able to make the string picks and Jason breathing from scratch, and he turned each of them into dedicated instruments. Just goes to show that Therewolf has a knack for scoring these fight animations, and it's probably the biggest distinction between him and Brandon. And the climax of the track is especially good, combining the iconic Halloween piano riff with the same string sounds you'd find in a Friday the 13th soundtrack. It's actually really chilling when it needs to be. But then we get to the conclusion, and this is where the stats issue arises for me. I think it would have been perfectly fine to have vaguely mentioned the feats in the analysis, and then give them dedicated numbers. Though I do think this works better than a conclusion like Zuko vs Shoto, for instance, because their argument here is more so based around Jason's regeneration and far superior healing, but I still think it could have used some numbers to truly cement how powerful Jason is in comparison to Michael. But even with all of the issues I brought up, for some weird reason, I can't help but say it's still a pretty good episode. 
It has its problems to be sure, but when taking the whole episode into account, they didn't feel as prevalent to me. Is it mostly carried by the analyses? Sure, yeah, I'll own up to that. But I still like the fight more than most other people. In fact, you know what? 64 out of 100. Oh, and by the way, you may have noticed that I did this entire review without ever once bringing up Devil Artemis' personal situation. That's because I still think he did a good job in spite of it. And it goes without saying that I don't appreciate people saying, They should just bring Torian back! He's so good! He's always made banger after banger and he defined death battle! Wow, I didn't know that we gaslit ourselves into liking Yang vs Tifa and Tracer vs Scout. Honestly, I have no idea why people randomly decided that he can't do it anymore just because of this one one episode, but people have the dumbest double standards for no reason, so props to them for owning up to it, I guess. But I do think a decent chunk of people are trying to make a bigger point. And it's with how their animation styles are different. Where Torian is a lot more of a choreographer who is more proficient in the fighting aspect of an animation. Whereas Devil Artemis, while he absolutely can make a fantastic fight animation, if I remember correctly, he's more so a hand animator that puts more emphasis on the acting aspects of animation. But what I think a lot of people overlook is that Devil Artemis is a master when it comes to environments and atmosphere. I mean, just look at some Something like Ganondorf vs Dracula for instance. Yes, he had help, but he still did a lot of work in making that episode look and feel scary and intimidating. And he's also great with cinematography, and I feel that these talents were able to shine here. If his personal situation was better, I still think he could have made a fantastic episode that a lot more people would have loved. Like I said, I just think that it needed more creative execution or at least some finer tuning. And as far as the quality of the animation goes, I think that this has less jank than something like Bond vs Wick for instance. And for the record, I'm not giving him any pity points because of his situation. I still think he did a decent job overall. Oh, and uh, for those wondering, no, this would not have worked in live action. I mean, have you seen the deaths from the previous live action episodes? Yeah, I failed to see how they could make a brutal looking kill in Jason vs. Michael or something. But still, let's use this episode as a means of saying, Modern Death Battles episodes are all terrible! <laughs> Uh, okay, maybe not terrible, but they've definitely been going downhill downhill ever since a single episode from season two. Or at least there's no way they can like change my mind on this. Right? Yep, Sauron vs. Lich King is getting the fully scripted rundown, and a part of it is completely out of spite. And y'all thought it was gonna go to Omnilander. Okay, that's kind of on me for misleading you in Season 7, so there's no need to blame yourself this time. I will admit, Sauron vs. Lich King doesn't exactly fit the theme of the other fully scripted rundowns I've done in previous seasons. It's not a season finale celebrating a milestone, it's not an episode that was stuck in my chest for years, it's not an absolute train wreck that basically required deeper digging, it's not my favorite episode of the show, and it's not the most hated episode in the show's history. I mean, I guess Dio card doesn't fit the theming either, but that one was more or less a special case. And Peak Masterpiece Lex vs. Doom is, uh, Peak Masterpiece Lex vs. Doom. This may be done out of spite, but I do have an overarching point to make with this, so bear with me for right now. I don't talk about this much, but while Warcraft isn't a series I've ever touched, fantasy novels have historically been important to my family. If there was a book written by J.R.R. Tolkien or C.S. Lewis, then it's more than likely someone in my family had it lying around the house somewhere. And yeah, that stays true to me as well. I grew up reading and or watching all sorts of series like Middle Earth, Chronicles of Narnia, Harry Potter, Warrior Cats, Percy Jackson, and probably my favorite book series from my childhood, The Guardians of Gahul. I mean, wow, who would have thunk that the Tales and Final Fantasy fanboy really likes fantasy books? Yeah, man, I was super excited to see Sauron on the show. While this was basically because Lord of the Rings was getting a new show, when the general public saw Sauron, who is THE Dark Lord of Fantasy, show up as one of the combatants teased for the second half of the season, it should come off as no surprise that the community's overall reaction was... Who's Sauron? Yeah, Middle-Earth is not even half a percent close to a niche series. I mean, it's the face of fantasy stories in general, but it just goes to show that Death Battle fans can't read. No shame in it. After all, I'm a long-time Pitman in Smash Brothers, so I can relate to a lack of media literacy. But like, how the hell do you guys know about Mob Psycho 100 or Full Metal Alchemist, yet you've never heard of Lord of the Rings? Like, I really don't get it. Not only was I ecstatic, but also surprised that the series debut was not with Gandalf. Side note, I have no beef with the matchup, I just find it kind of 
average. But this? I don't think even I knew what to expect until doing some digging and witnessing the possibility of them debuting Warcraft as well. Sure, I've never played it, but I know how massive Warcraft is. I feel like this has acted as a gateway for more fantasy-themed death battles. You know, like Undead Dragon, Guts Mitri, and if you want to count it. Let's see how Death Battle handles these two iconic Dark Lords. Sauron's analysis has a lot to talk about. He hasn't had a lot of visual media dedicated to him, so in terms of visuals, they mainly had to rely on using fan art. <laughs> Please tell me these were credited. As well as various unrelated scenes from the movies and the same scene of Sauron spread across the rundown. It's kind of like with Her Kong where it adds some variety to the visuals. But the other benefit is that the entire rundown essentially focuses on the lore of Middle-earth and Sauron's role in the story. From the wars to the rings of power to the Shire to his demise, they paint him as a ruthless schemer before going into his feats of strength. They might not give him any numbers to work with, but that doesn't matter to me because this rundown otherwise has the best combination of story, lore, and versus stats of the season, feeling more akin to a polished Season 2 analysis. I mean, they dedicate a full panel to the One Ring, which gives them an opportunity to cover its powers and capabilities since they said it was the most powerful ring, which they claim he made in secret. And then they give Sauron a handful of island-level feats, but they wait until after discussing what he was doing behind the scenes. All of this works for me because Middle-earth has one of the most fleshed out and revolutionary worlds in all of fiction, so if they went about it like a typical respect thread, I'd argue it would have been a massive disservice to both the character and the series he comes from. You know how I criticize Soul and Ryuko's analyses for skimming over world building and focusing on the less interesting stuff about their series? This is the stark opposite. It's especially imperative because, memes aside, not everyone knows that much about Sauron. I mean, he was barely in the movies, at least in a physical form, so here it feels like like they're giving a well-documented exposition of Middle-earth to explain what Sauron was doing the whole time, going over how deadly and crafty he can be and why the viewer should take him seriously. And even the cutaway manages to be funny while never taking me out of the analysis. It starts with Boomstick getting tempted by the ring, being infatuated by the kind of feast he would have, and Wiz getting genuinely concerned and trying to snap him out of it. But then Boomstick eats the ring because of how hungry he becomes after thinking about the ring's whispering, and then Wiz shows up with a sword and shield, worried that he may have to fight his friend, but then he becomes frustrated with Boomstick because of how nervous he was. And speaking of power, the ending note they give about Sauron's lack of resistance for absolute power led him to underestimating the mortals and hobbits is structured so well and ties into the themes of Lord of the Rings immaculately, ending with a quote from the book series that gives a chilling final note to this rundown. The Lich King's analysis didn't resonate with me as well, but make no mistake, it's just as good as Sauron's for the same reasons. It's just that I would be repeating my Myself if I said the baseline reasons with how I'd praise their coverage of the lore and its natural implementation of versus feats, all of that is still prevalent. I think the only thing worth mentioning by itself is that the final episode actually alters a sentence from Lich King's preview, that being the part where they imply that Startholm is the capital of Lordaeron, which it's apparently not, so that part was changed. And aside from that, I don't have as much to say, so instead, I would like to use this as an opportunity to share how the episode manages to tie the combatants' of stories together in brilliant ways. Just because it's something I've brought up every once in a while, but I've never elaborated. See, the thing about Death Battle Rundowns is that there's supposed to be a lot of emphasis on the characters. Not just what they can do in a fight or what feats they've done, but what their personality is like, the journey they've gone through, and even some lesser known facts and trivia about them in their series. And that's just in the first rundown. The second one is where they start sprinkling in some parallels with the combatant that they previously discussed. Yes, sometimes it does involve Boomstick doing that thing where he says, Now where have I heard this one before? But it's at its best when it's subtle enough to where they never state the connections out loud, but the viewer can still put two and two together and say, Oh hey, it's just like that other guy they just talked about. Sometimes they'll even get a bit creative and have Boomstick make a funny that ties the two together in other subtle ways. And this episode does this in spades. With Lich King's analysis following the same structure on Sauron's where there's an intentionally prominent amount of lore dumps that are meant to build up to the part where they cover the corrupted figure in question. They also approach Frostmourne the same way they approach the One Ring in the sense of it being a powerful artifact that corrupts those who wield it. And they also feature an all-seeing eye ability. These are things a keen viewer would notice if they pay attention to the analysis. And if it gets displayed in the fight animation, it rewards them for it. Uh, spoiler alert, you're gonna hear me talking about this shot a lot. Lich King's analysis also does something that taps into the less subtle ways of connecting the combatants, but it's actually kind of clever here. When talking about his armor, Boomstick accidentally pronounces it as Sauronite's armor, before correcting himself and calling it 
Terranite. I like to think that this was Boomstick seeing all of the parallels to Sauron that he accidentally says his name in his opponent's analysis. I don't know, I just found it funny for that reason. And then the viewer starts making the realization that the two have something in common. And if that didn't, I feel like the same ending note of underestimating the warriors who took him down should help with that. This perfect pacing means that even if the fight was simply good and not much else, it was gonna be a strong contender for my top three of the season. But thankfully, the fight has a lot of good things to talk about. Once the fight starts, we immediately get to see the Blender team flexing their visual prowess. Ice Throne is already such a unique battlefield and feels perfect for a setting like High Fantasy, and supposedly it's based on the Ice Crown Citadel from Warcraft, so cool! And then you have this shot of Artha sitting on the throne, which does look low poly, but in the charming old school PC gaming way, where the limited animation of Arthas's glowing eyes make its presence menacing. And then Sauron shows up and his shadow covers the entire area in front of him. And this is where we get to hear the combatants' first words. I shall claim what is mine. In this cold north, you will find only death. Yeah, I can totally buy Sauron seeking that throne. There's no crossover feeling like with Bond vs. Wick or even Tanjojo, but Sauron seeking more power, likely the power that comes from Frostmourne, is fitting for him. And Arthas's warning lines could also be referencing how he became tainted by its power, as well as the weight he had to carry as the Lich King. Of course, there are more badass lines of dialogue, but I think I'll put a pin in those. Until then, all you need to know is that the voice acting is very strong. Ryan's Solus as Sauron heavily reminds me of a higher-pitched noob Cybot, but that's not a bad thing. It adds a snake-like venom to his voice that matches the classic chanting you often hear from him. It does blend in with the chanting, but it works well in the context of portraying Sauron as an omnipresent threat. And on the side to take yet another L, Philip Sacramento gives a perfect Arthas. Not as much to say except for how it's giving me heavy Michael McConaughey vibes, which I mean in the best way because McConaughey is the Lich King's original voice actor. <laughs> And when he needs to give a chilling delivery, it's ice cold. You serve me now. And when he needs to get louder, he does so without straying from his serious demeanor. Then the action begins and they start attacking one another, and this is honestly some of the best weapon combat of any 3D episode. The swings feel heavy yet swift, and the impact that a couple of Sauron strike leave on the icy ground sell me on their power. I feel like the only attacks that don't look good are this weird first person view of Sauron's mace and this sloppy air slash from Arthas, but even with the latter, while it doesn't justify how he's still floating, given that he's in a chokehold, it could explain the wobbly movements. And with the former shot, it at least has a reason for it. That being to demonstrate Arthas' teleportation, and along with that, they use a high amount of their powers, and they play off of each other in creative ways, but it's not quite for the same reasons as you would expect. When abilities play off of each other in other fights, it's often meant to display an advantage, like when death battle researchers ask themselves how a combatant can deal with a certain ability from their opponent, and their answer usually comes in the form of an ability of their own. Got a giant wave of fire coming at you? Fire shield! Opponent sneaking up on you too much? A nose? Nose! Sword knocked out of your hands because your enemy likes fighting dirty? Come on man, you know ninjutsu! Some episodes take creative liberties that may not be 100% reflective of the research, but still make the fight more engaging and entertaining entertaining without contradicting the conclusion. Trying to keep up with all of these outlandish weapons and machines? Use your own creativity and quick wit to keep up. Outclassed in CQC? Use a shard of glass from the window you just broke. But Sauron vs. Lich King actually does both of these, but instead of being exclusively reflective of the research, it's meant to reflect their goals within this fight. It's not so much to take the other guy down, but to control them as well. You see this in moments like how the damned souls are used. When Arthas first sends one over, it's not used as an attack, but as a means of restraint. Sauron. This forces Sauron to use the One Ring to break free from its control, and then he converts the soul into a minion for himself. It's also demonstrated with this snowstorm from Arthas. His goal is to obscure Sauron's sight to find an opening, but how does Sauron respond? By using the One Ring to erupt a volcano and clear the snow, eventually turning it into rain? And then we have Sauron's I SEE YOU line. Admittedly, I don't buy the idea that Arthas wasn't going for a sneak attack until after he said the line. I mean, I'm pretty sure that Arthas not being in front of Sauron after the volcano eruption gave a pretty clear idea that Arthas was planning one. 
However, this line means something I'd argue is infinitely more badass anyway. See, Arthas' storm was a way of asserting himself as a threat. He's trying to intimidate Sauron. But when Sauron dissipates the snowstorm and says the line, he's stating that he knows this, and proves that he is not impressed by anything he's been doing. And then they have another sword fight for a while, where Sauron asserts his dominance by catching Frostmourne in his hand. It's like that one scene in Jason vs. Michael, but here, not only does Sauron's catch have actual recoil, but it also makes him bleed. He tried making another power move, but wait, big mistake, bruv, because now he's draining your power, symbolized by these limp mace swipes, the last one being so weak that he accidentally drops it. At last, Arthas has Sauron where he wants him, but nope, he transforms into the Eye of Sauron. And I will say that this vision thing confused me at first, but after doing some reading, I learned that this is a vision of Bolvar, the Lich King following Arthas' death. And this is the part where Sauron conveys that Arthas will inevitably fall, naturally pissing him off. But he also starts to feel flustered, so he tries attacking the vision head on, but to no avail. And then Sauron destroys Frostmourne, and even the Eye of Acherus, apparently. And as Sauron's eye flashes on screen, proving once and for all that Sauron is the one in control. And when Arthas dies, which is apparently a reenactment of his canonical death in World of Warcraft, Sauron doesn't just kill him, he uses the souls that were trapped within Frostmourne, converts them to his side, and uses them to rip Arthas' soul from his body, taking what was rightfully his. I know that that was a long-winded paragraph, but I only went into so much detail with this one thing because this actually translates perfectly with Tolkien's belief that absolute power corrupts. It's a very prevalent theme in Lord of the Rings, and to see that directly conveyed to this degree in a f***ing DEATH BATTLE OF ALL THINGS? <laughs> MIND BLOWN! And it's even represented visually with how the citadel gradually goes from blue to red-orange, especially when you realize that the volcano is supposed to be Sauron summoning the fires of Mordor. That alone was gonna put it in my top two for the season, but there are many other great things about this fight. As mentioned earlier, the voice acting rules, and while there aren't too many lines, you know what they say, quality over quantity. It's very basic dialogue, yet with the context I went over, none of the lines feel like non sequiturs. Certainly not this exchange. I'll tear out your heart. You will find nothing. Which I'm pretty sure is supposed to be a reference to this part from Arthas' rundown. You've all had one of those days, right? Where you see all of humanity is so pathetic they can only be saved by just killing them all, so you rip out your own heart! Yeah, relatable! And another line of dialogue worth praising is Sauron's final line. His response to Arthas' warning from earlier is a reference to his iconic speech from The Lord of the Rings. That's so cool! It's portrayed as if he knew that this cold north would find him death. Sauron did take what was rightfully his. He did see Arthas in his demise. Specifically, he saw him in the void that he was bringing to him. And the fact that I, as a Middle Earth fan, completely forgot that this was a reference should speak volumes as to how well implemented this line is. And that's to say nothing of the visuals that follow it. I mean, you may not have the Eye of Sauron or the Eye of Acherus, but you still have eyes that can see this, right? I've already mentioned the environment and its changing colors, but this shot of the eyes alone probably has the best visuals of the show. The context of it being more so Sauron is foreshadowing Arthas' demise, who's really just trying to figure out what the message is supposed to mean, makes this climax feel unique. Not to mention the snow from the beginning turns into rain during this part. Of course, you have the really well done snowstorm effects and the damned souls. Like, damn souls, you looking kinda nice. Seriously, the cinematography is on a whole nother level. But to me, they wouldn't be nearly as impressive if it weren't for the camera work and posing. I mean, sure, the models are scaled kinda weirdly. Like, just take a look at a few screenshots and you can see that their heads look awkwardly proportioned. But when you watch them move, it's reminiscent of those older 3D episodes where the action is being accentuated by the camera work. And this, combined with the Blender team's knack for characterization, expression work, and visuals, make this the most cinematic episode of the show in my eyes. And yes, I know precisely what's coming next season, and I still stand by that. There's just something about all of these angles and poses that make these essentially faceless beings give off more personality than various episodes with characters known for having lots of personality. This shot of the giant eye says so much about these two, with how Arthas just stares in awe at this projection, which basically says that his evisceration is imminent. Or even this angle of Sauron's I see you line, where it hides the sneak attack from the viewer to convey how Sauron's awareness is far more impressive than the viewer would expect. There are plenty of other shots like these, but most of them are hard to explain. 
but one that I can explain is this last shot of Sauron sitting on Arthas' throne, where the blue ice is emanating a reddish color completely, along with the area generally removing all sense of blue. Excellent use of color grading. And each of these shots are even stronger thanks to the track, One King to Rule Them All. Mouthful of a title aside, did you know that this track has lyrics? Yeah, those chants in the background are actually trying to say something. Nothing super special, but some of it is actually in Sundarin, the elven language that Tolkien made for his series. And that chord progression during the eye scene? <laughs> Absolutely phenomenal. And even outside of that, it's still a very dramatic track that matches everything in the episode while referencing the Wrath of the Lich King title theme and the Rings theme. This is also the third and final episode of the season to receive an epilogue track, which I can only imagine as the fires of Mordor engulfing Arthas' entire realm, as if it didn't do that already. Or maybe it could be referencing the Super Sauron idea that Boomstick references. Either interpretation works. And finally, there's the conclusion. They don't use any of the higher end feats that I saw in the G1 blog as they apparently find the scaling tricky to figure out, but they do believe that Sauron would be stronger regardless. And by the feats they use, yeah, it works. They mostly rely on the island-related feats they mentioned earlier, which makes sense to me as those were the feats that received the most focus in the analyses. This fixes the exact problem I had with Jason vs. Michael's conclusion, where bringing up the numbers here would not have taken away from the immersion they were trying to set up. And the argument itself mostly holds up, but I do agree that they did a poor job justifying them being equal in speed. Sauron received a speed feat, but I don't think Arthas received any before this point. They say that the speed feat came from Illidan, but the only other time he was mentioned was when they brought up how Arthas made him into a jobber. In other words, it was a feat of power, not speed. Or at least they never clarified that he kept up with Illidan's speed or whatever. Other than that, yeah, favorite of the season free, but what was that overarching point I mentioned earlier? Well, if this is an indicator of anything, I would like to point out that Jason vs. Michael, a legacy horror fight featuring two of the most iconic movie franchises in general, which had so many stars aligning for it to get a sh ton of views, never made it on the YouTube trending page. But Sauron vs. Lich King, a matchup featuring characters significantly less popular in the versus community, and was only really known about in a select few circles, along with Rings of Power losing relevance and Warcraft having nothing special going on during the time, reached number three on the YouTube trending trending page when it aired. So let me take that football you're hiding underneath that leg so that I can get a good kick over that field goal. When we inevitably get to see new tales get told on Death Battle, don't sweep the episode under the rug just because you don't know the characters particularly well. People like Biff Weed and Leopold never called Snake vs. Sam the objectively best episode of Death Battle because they knew or cared about Sam Fisher, you know. How many times do I have to say it? Not liking a matchup should never cloud your judgment of its episode. Even with my case for Venom vs. Krona, I could have ranked it lower than Venom vs. Bane entirely because of the matchup, but I didn't do that because that's unfair to what the episode gets right. And sure, bias is gonna come into play. Some people aren't gonna click with this episode as much. Some people might even unfairly dislike it to a degree. HYPER! But that's not what I'm getting at. I'm saying that there's always at least something to appreciate in a good episode. And regardless of who's making the 3D episodes, Death Battle today is more than capable of capturing the same magic that Torian gave us in the earlier seasons. To even my surprise, I believe that Sauron vs. Lich King surpasses all of them to me. Like, I was always gonna like it more than Snake vs. Sam, for instance, but after writing my review for this episode, I was shocked to see it surpass Tony vs. Lex, Ryu vs. Jin, Dante vs. Bayonetta, and even Balrog vs. TJ Combo. Even knowing how good this season was, Sauron vs. Lich King unexpectedly nailed itself a spot in my top five favorite episodes of the show, possibly even top three. We'll cross that bridge when we get there. But to think, I only gave it a fully scripted rundown out of spite, but as I was fleshing it out, it later become done out of immense admiration. 99 out of 100. Literally the only reason it's not a full 100 out of 100 is because they did a poor job in justifying their equalized speeds. That's it. That's the only real issue I have with this entire episode. So yeah, shoutouts to the people saying Death Battle was going downhill following Jason vs. Michael. You silly little wankers should pipe down and put at least a little bit of effort into searching for value in everything you're reviewing, even if you have no attachment to it.
And I'm sure that everyone in the community learned from this and would never make this mistake ever again. We could single-handedly create the worst waiting period of the season. That works too. I mean, I've talked about bad waiting periods in the last season, but keep in mind, I wasn't really a part of the community during the time, so I wasn't able to get a full opinion on waiting periods like the one for Thorgita, Omnilander, and the like. But with Deku vs. Asta, I was in the community during this time, so I had to witness all the nonsense. Which means that I got to see this episode leave the target audience, and see this episode get reached out to a very interesting subset of Black Clover fans. And for the record, I am not talking about the people who took issue with Asta's characterization. That's an issue I will absolutely be talking about, but that's not what made the waiting period so miserable. I'm referring to the people who saw the sneak peek and said, Why didn't Asta one-shot Deku? Or, Deku's a weak protagonist. Asta's broken. He should have won. Why did he compare Deku's speed to luck? He's living lightning. He should be faster than Deku. And like, with series like Dragon Ball, Ben 10, Marvel, DC, and screw it, Transformers, at at least they have several arguments that get them universal or higher. So like, in a roundabout way, I can somewhat understand why those people got so toxic with Death Battle. But with Black Clover, from what I've looked into, they don't even go up to planet level. Those people had like no reason to be upset over this. In fact, this is Rolo. He is the weakest character in the entire Tales of series, yet he still stomps and blisses the entire Black Clover verse billions of times over. Cry about it! But don't worry, I have some words for Deku vs. Asta as well, because, uh... Okay, this is probably going to be the hottest take I have to say, but I think that Liam Swan might not be as good of a writer as we've been hyping him up to be. Hello? What are you fucking talking about? That's a good question, so let me start by saying I am not trying to say that Liam is a bad writer. Not even a quarter of a percent close. If anything, I am a huge fan of his writing style and think it works wonders for Death Battle specifically. In the fight animation, he has all sorts of cool callbacks to previous lines in an animation, or even parts of the analyses. And I also think he does a great job at blending in story and versus stats while never once taking away from the episode. It's just that when you look at his entire repertoire, it's kind of shocking how inconsistent he is. Of of course, that's not the only reason I'm bringing this up now. Herschel is my favorite writer of the show, and even I have to admit he had a rough start. But you have to keep in mind that Liam's not just a writer. He's also the lead researcher for most, if not every episode. He's a regular on the Death Battle cast, and he's even directed quite a few episodes. But when people say that Liam deserves to cook up a banquet or whatnot, I feel like we're exclusively looking at like two, three, maybe four of his episodes at most, as opposed to his entire overall repertoire. Something that's often problematic for me specifically is that he really, really likes to include humor in his script. And if he's writing an episode for a matchup that has a lot of comedy involved, then by all means, go off. But more often than not, he is just not good at adding humor where it's relevant. And the only reason I think this problem is so prominent is because he should not be doing as much as he is. Of course, he can still do all of these things, as ironically, this also proves how talented of a man he is. But at the same time, you cannot look at the guy who wrote Dio vs. Alucard and Blake vs. Mikasa in the same season and tell Tell me that he doesn't need to lighten his workload at least a little bit. I'm not saying that they should just hire more writers, as if you have any understanding of how big companies work, it's not that simple. But unless if I'm missing something, I think that Liam should be writing less episodes and only doing series he's familiar with. Otherwise, have Herschel and DJ writing more episodes for him, or at least with him, or bring back Ultra Guy and Jangor. They can cook up an amazing script too, you know? But the reason I'm saying this now is because I wholeheartedly believe that Deku vs. Asta is Liam's worst outing on the entire show. Even worse than Blue. Dairy. Over the course of this review, I will be explaining why, but it's not gonna start with Deku's analysis much. I actually thought it was alright. Yeah, it's technically more of a respect thread, but they covered his character pretty well, and I really like how they handled his rivalry with Bakugo. With how he gave him the nickname Deku as a reference to Deku Nobu, then go over how Deku was able to surpass Bakugo and earn the nickname Dekiru, and then how they built a mutual respect for one another, and finally the big feat involves the two of them sharing one for all. This is that clever blend of verses and story that Liam excels in. 
Plus, they name drop all sorts of characters, including the Annihilator's best matchup. And on the editing side of things, there's this shot of an older Deku's manga panel looking at some anime clips of his younger self. Mmm, this is actually really powerful, especially with how it transitions into the big feat with Bakugo. But of course, you have not so good moments like the shoot style joke and a nothing cutaway where it feels like they're making three different jokes at once and speed running through the interesting abilities for no reason. Yeah, I mean, it's still at least decent, though at least in comparison to Asta's analysis, and this is where my gripes with Liam's writing style can come into play. Not in terms of covering the world of Black Clover. The stuff they say about magic, anti-magic, mana, and the like is all pretty interesting, and their dissection of Asta's rivalry with Yuno was heavily appreciated. Even if it did come out of nowhere, I like how it was there in the first place. But this whole analysis feels like it's bogged down by some really bad jokes that have no reason to exist. And from what I've heard, none of them are popular Black Clover memes. Like, obviously the cutaway gag is low-hanging fruit, but Low-key, it's kind of incompetently written. Like, the joke is that Wiz and Boomstick are fighting over the book, but since their explanations are too long, it takes the focus away from the joke and makes each cut feel like they forgot about their own running gag every single time. And it doesn't even get a proper punchline. It ends with Wiz calling himself the book boy, and it abruptly cuts off before either one of them wins the struggle. With that? That's my favorite joke of the analysis, because every single time they talk about Asta, I hate it here. I really got annoyed by the constant jock type and shove people into a locker references. If it really, really matters that you have to add it, just make it a one-off comment, not a running gag. And they also gotta call him a screaming goblin child for no reason. And while mentioning the Yuno thing was nice, nothing in this analysis was built up to it. Certainly not in the way they built up Deku's rivalry with Bakugo. Okay, but outside of that, do they at least respect Asta as a character? And despite his headstrong and irritating personality, aka screaming at the top of his lungs as often as possible. Oh, that's really interesting. Actually, no, 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 no. Come here, come here, come here. Taking the shades off, taking the shades off. I need you to look at me. Look at me right now, right now. So death battle. You guys are a fan of Dragon Ball, right? You know how they yell out their powers, right? By screaming. You know how they power up into stronger forms. Screaming. You know what practically defines the entire f***ing franchise to a degree? Screaming. And that's perfectly fine, like you like what you like, but let's look at Asta again. From what I could gather by doing a two minute Google search, I was able to notice that Asta is only a screamer in one episode. And even then, that only applies to the Japanese dub as the English voice actor tones it down by a lot, but whatever, whatever, whatever. Let's pretend that he is a complete screamer for just that one episode, regardless of which version you watch. I have a question for you, Death Battle, and this is not rhetorical, I am actually expecting an answer from you. A web series hosted by fictional characters, but whatever, whatever. How is it that this is irritating, yet this is peak? Because speaking of someone who I'm pretty sure has more than 10 brain cells, at least I think I do, I could be wrong about that, but I kind of failed to see the logic you're going with here, and would like at least a little more elaboration. But if that's too much for you, then um, I guess we can just move on to talking about the fight, and whew, there's a lot to cover. But if nothing else, they do at least point out that Asta is an intelligent fighter. I just gotta hit him really hard. Oh boy! Let's get into the fight now! Okay, say whatever you will about the matchup and how good it is compared to something like Deku versus Gon or Asta versus Meliodas, which, quick tangent, but if literally anything from Seven Deadly Sins appears on Death Battle before any of my favorite series getting debuted or returning on the show, I will actually vomit blood on the spot. I have never seen an art style or character design that I've wanted to beat the sh** out of in a while. I just hate everything about it. And I don't want Death Battle to talk about this series ever, unless it's an Escanor matchup. Escanor actually does look pretty cool. But one of the core connections of Deku versus Asta is that both are tactical and intelligent fighters, and it's even represented adequately with their inner monologues. But why is this Asta's first line? I feel like this episode has a running theme of trying to go for a personality contrast, but that doesn't work here because that directly goes against the matchup's connections. Why even bother going with the unpopular matchup idea if you were never gonna make it remotely accurate? 
accurate to the characters. But once the fight begins, we are off to an okay start, with Deku using his speed pretty well, and Asta gaining some respect for him. To think that the luck reference was the line that got people's panties in a twist, and not the line that's actually out of character and inconsistent with Death Battle's own description of the character. But then again, it's not like Deku has some of the best lines either, because, uh... Heart sword's supposed to be sharp? Probably my, uh, third least favorite line of the episode. I'm told that Jose Estrada's Deku is an accurate impression, but with lines like this, it comes across like an abridged voice actor trying to be serious for the first time in his life. I'M PREGNANT CAUTION! Oh, okay, that makes sense, that makes sense. He has his moments, and I'll get to them in a bit, but some of his line reads just don't do it for me. Michael Kovacs Asta is pretty good, though, poor writing notwithstanding. His black meteorite is delivered very well, and of course, his give me everything you got scream is mesmerizing. But I can't say I like the action in this episode. Sometimes it feels like it's more interested in being a meme than a good fight. Like, there's a Detroit Smash scene. Why does Deku spam it? Is this a My Hero Aka meme of sorts? I mean, he has all sorts of other smashes, yet he only uses one of them. Like, why? And yeah, he uses Black Whip and Gear Shift, but from what I've heard, they're not represented particularly well. The former looks more like a symbiote web, and the latter is something that doesn't look like anything Gear Shift can do. Gear Shift is supposed to increase the speed of the things he touches, right? So, tell me, how does that translate to using it to lift a chunk of the building? Unless it's supposed to be the building chunk from when Asta broke the building? But wasn't that moving towards Deku? Like, how does this work exactly? But going back to the Detroit Smash scene, while I do like the strategy of Deku using the Black Whip to get the weapons off of him, I don't like how he uses it all the time. Is spamming it like this even possible? And why does it sound like he's shooting a plasma gun? Detroit Smash! Detroit Smash! And for Asta's side of things, I get that he wasn't able to cut it off, but then he pulls out a new sword and lets himself get hit a few more times, and it's revealed that that sword was able to cut the Black Whip, so it's like, why didn't he do that in the first place? Oh, but of course, we really gotta get a quirky one-liner about Detroit! F*** you, Liam. Detroit's a great city. Change my mind. And then there's this weird cut here with a goofy Deku... <laughs> I guess I like the clashes because green and red are my favorite colors, but the sound design, while not as bad as the Detroit Smash spamming, isn't that great. And then Deku does that Season 7 spinning nonsense. Taking notes from Blendere, aren't we? But then the music quiets down, and Deku says this. No use not going all out anymore. I just gotta hit him really hard! Really? That's the line you're giving a callback to? I get that they were trying to convey how Deku needed to focus on less strategy, and I like the idea on paper, but the thing is that Deku's strategy barely came into play. Seeing him using his speed and the Black Whip thing were nifty, but everything else is something that any other character would do. I'm not a My Hero Aka guy, but from what I've heard, his powers are basic, but the appeal of his fight scenes are how he uses them. This death battle fight is not convincing me of that at all. And having Deku reference Asuka first line just feels completely unearned. Though I will admit, seeing Deku repeat the final line that All Might said in his fight against Might Guy, with the plus ultra visuals and the literal nod to him, still gives me chills. And then, Asta shows up with the Libe thing and you can barely hear his scream, and uh, this next clash is gonna have no impact. Yep, yep, this clash had no impact. You know, goody, Asta's butt crack is showing. And supposedly, this final blow was meant to kill the audience. But then the audience still cheered, which broke my immersion, implying that I had any to begin with. And oh wait, I forgot to talk about the death. From what I've heard, Deku was meant to die with his final blow, just so we could see a kill via Asta outlasting Deku. I like this idea. It's something new. But then, uh, Asta, what's with those swords? Um, uh, okay, yeah, this is a dick move. No way around it. I forgot where I heard this, but the team's explanation for this is that Asta's key sensing, the thing that makes Black Clover characters Black Clover characters, randomly stopped working in this specific moment and nowhere else. Sorry for wanting an interesting ending, I guess, but we gotta have one last quirky LOL Detroit bad line as if that would make any sense. I mean, look, if it really, really mattered that they needed to shoehorn one last Detroit meme, then Asta should have said, good fight, Detroit. It would have fit Asta's character infinitely better. Maybe it wouldn't have justified the low blow he made, but it would have made more sense than this. Okay, let's talk about Asta's portrayal now, because I don't think I've seen a single person say that Asta was in character. Where was that Libe guy? Like, he got a cameo in the beginning and then leaves until it's climax time, and from what I've heard, he wouldn't even be receiving any outside help from him, so why is he left out here? You could at least have him butting in the fight on occasion to help Asta strategize or something. Surely that could have worked, right? And with the swords thing, where did they come from? If he's beaten this badly, and he was literally beaten out of his strongest form, how is he able to 
generate multiple swords seemingly from thin air. Isn't it established that he can only summon these swords from his book? How did he do this? Were they already there? Well, that would make no sense because he didn't try to summon any in their final clash. And if it needed to be this way, it should have had Asta preparing the swords and then dodging Deku's punch, or at least the swords hit Deku first, and then he wins the clash at the end. If anything, that should take less time and effort than the ending we got instead. And just generally, this is what happens when Liam's writing style does not work for a death battle episode. I love the guy and have an undying respect for the efforts he makes on death battle, but you can really tell when he doesn't know anything about the characters. And he's even admitted that he barely knows anything about My Hero Akka or Black Clover. But even if that was the case, I guarantee there would have been infinitely better ways of writing this episode than calling Asta an irritating screaming goblin child, or having Deku not only spam one of his strongest attacks, but also having each one of them do virtually nothing impactful, or having Asta portrayed like a dumb jock when he's very clearly not like this from what I've heard. Or better yet, having a hate boner for the very few bits of screaming he does in the entire Black Clover series, only to have Deku do way, way more screaming than Asta. Even with Blin Dairy, not only did it still feel like the characters were being portrayed as the characters, but given the time period the episode came out, they could have absolutely made an obnoxiously long tangent about how modern NRS writing bad, Sindel retcon stupid. But no, he didn't do that. He actually restrained himself and focused on trying to make Sindel sound like a cool character and only bringing up the alternate timelines when it felt necessary to do so. And again, the luck line was what pissed people off the most or Asta not one-shotting Deku even? And what's funny is that these same people who were complaining about these things just disappeared a week after the episode aired, which further proves my point that they had no reason to be complaining to the civil Black Clover fans who were just trying to give this episode the benefit of the doubt and putting an effort to enjoy both it and the waiting period, I'm genuinely sorry that you had the death battle community not familiar with Black Clover practically define you by such an obnoxious minority. You guys deserved way better than this. Ah, uh, poor Deku. He tried his best, but Asta just shoved him into that great big locker in the sky. And they couldn't go five seconds in the conclusion without another locker reference. Shut up! The rest of the conclusion is okay, though I've heard that the big feat they describe for Asta isn't related to AP or even energy output, but there are other feats of similar power that Death Battle could have used. It's like with how they tried to justify me being massively faster than light by scaling to Dio using my body. But also like with that moment, I'm not docking points for it because I don't do that with outside factors in the versus department, unless if it contradicts their logic or if it contradicts a point in the animation. But just know, I'm aware of the criticism and I do agree with it. I've been talking a lot about this episode and I did not expect that, but I want to go over one more thing. When people say death battle is biased, they exclusively refer to how their favorite character lost to a DC character or something. Those people are not worth acknowledging and I don't want to hear it. You know what death battle being biased actually looks like? How about when it feels like they go out of their way to not make a character sound cool and just blatantly insult them because logic, reasoning, and lack thereof, and when they're represented poorly because it feels like the team did not have any interest in celebrating the character or the series he comes from. I can't believe I'm saying this super friend's Aquaman received more respect than Asta did, and seeing him being reduced to a meme character was intentional for the sake of a joke episode. Fucking hell, they even made Homelander sound like he had any humanity left in him. I fail to see why they couldn't have made Asta sound in any way interesting. We're in season 9, with the debut of a new series that not too many people in the Versa community knew a lot about, with me being one of those people, and the ones who did know about him were likely aware of the undeserved hate Asta received. So just imagine how they'd have to feel when they see Death Battle, a show that's meant to celebrate the characters as well as determine who would win in a fight, acting so needlessly hostile and alienating Black Clover fans for liking the character for what I can only assume to be for no reason. And it's not like Deku fans were treated that much better. Certainly not during the waiting period where everyone wanted him to die because, well, I mean, this one guy on the internet once said that Deku's a bad character, so he's clearly a bad character and that's my opinion. Despite the fact that even as someone who has never read or watched My Hero Akka, Deku is undoubtedly one of the most overhated characters in all of fiction. All right, all right, let's dial it back for right now. I really don't like talking negatively in this sort of way, so let's end it off with something positive.
Strongest Alive, one of the best tracks of the season easily. I still prefer One King, Princes of Pride, and Hedge of Tomorrow, but I still like listening to this one. Though I have heard there's not a lot of Black Clover representation, but then I noticed that the intent was supposed to be vocals are all My Hero Aka, and instrumentals are all Black Clover. And after taking a brief listen to Black Clover's surprisingly high tier soundtrack, I can sort of see it? I reckon the strings are supposed to be Black Clover-esque, but I think the musical style would have been far more apparent if they were more midi evil sounding. You know, like in Black Clover's high tier soundtrack. Like seriously, it's so good. How come no one ever told me this? I just wish that such a godlike track wasn't attached to such an insufferable death battle episode. I still really like Liam and his writing style, but times like this are exactly why you will never see me hopping on the hashtag let Liam cook train. 36 out of 100. Keep in mind, this is coming from someone who knew nothing about Black Clover until the episode came out and still hasn't checked out the series. Just imagine how hard I would have gone if I was a fan. But you know what? We got one episode left. I was technically late to the premiere of this and had to hide myself from spoilers for several hours, so give me that season finale. I can take whatever it is you have. Oh! Okay, don't worry, this isn't gonna be another Deku vs. Asta, nor is this gonna be another Omega rant like I did with the mistake, Aang vs. Edward, or especially not Ragnar vs. Soul. I just wanted to give a rough recreation of my exact reaction to this episode's announcement. And then I see that it has an extended waiting period. This matchup. Not Saitama vs. Popeye, which had a lot of changes in the animation style and art style. Not Hulk vs. Broly, which was meant to celebrate 10 years of death battle, but I digress. But remember the G1 blogs that I reference from time to time? Well, they often get released the day before the episode airs. But with Gogeta vs. Vegito, the G1 prediction blog was finished only four days after it was announced. And then they instantly made a blog for Gogeta vs. Omnimon, which unironically took way longer despite essentially researching the exact same stuff. And also having a clear-cut verdict. No one I knew was excited for this. Heck, people even forgot that he was coming out. And it's the season finale. But look, despite being a Dragon Ball hater, I'm not gonna go hard on on this episode. I don't even have that much to say anyway. There were people on the team who really wanted to make this episode, and I'm very happy that they got to work on one of their passion projects. I do like how the prelude is Wizen Boomstick collecting the seven Dragon Balls to make it happen. It's a fun concept that taps into the character traits I enjoyed from Excalibur vs. Raiden, where we got to see them being Versa debaters. And then we get into Gogeta's analysis, and it wonderfully sets up the vibe we're in for. It's basically just Wizen Boomstick gushing about Dragon Ball and mentioning obscure characters and trivia from the franchise. And I also really like the fanfiction line. Even even if it's the same joke they made in Trunks vs. Silver, I honestly think it's funnier here because the joke is that Boomstick finds Food's full name and his ridiculous amount of DNA to be really weird. And it's gone over in a way that's endearing. I think the only part that made me groan was when they said that seeing yet another palette swap of Goku was the best moment of my life given that there's already like 10 of them, but aside from that, it's harmless. It's not so different from Vegito's analysis. Barring the joke about Vegerot, which was okay, and the phrasing joke which was nothing special, but it had a good delivery. But what's disappointing is that neither one of these analyses had a lot of fun or creative edits like most of the rest of the season had, which makes them even less memorable than they would be otherwise. And as for the fights, well, it sure happened. I mean, it does that thing from Naruto vs Ichigo, where they include all of their powers for the sake of it rather than because it makes sense for the fight, and none of their abilities or transformations have any time to sink in properly. I mean, the Big Bang Kamehameha vs Final Kamehameha in particular was hella rushed, feeling like blaster shots instead of powerful beams. It also What's with all of these random locations? I get that the intent was to break reality with each attack, but it feels like shoehorn fan service. And in general, the fan service feels like it leaves a lot to be desired. And the voice performances don't do too much to make up for it. Not that they're bad. Nick Landis is still a great Vegeta, and as for Michael Kovac as Goku, I think I'll hold my tongue for now. So instead, I would like to spend the remainder of this section asking a question. Did this episode truly need to have an extended waiting period? Michael Kovac is supposedly sounding like Moscow X here, right? If that's the case, then why not just get Moscow X back? I mean, I know they probably said something about how they want to distance themselves from Moscow X, but like, why not get a Sean Schemmel sound alike? Hell, why not get another Vegeta voice? Like, have you heard Tom Shock's Vegeta? It's unironically amazing. If you're gonna convince us that they have any differences in personality and that the debate is in any way interesting, why would you give them the exact same voice? And why is it only three 
minutes. Last season's was nearly four and a half minutes, and that one also had way more going on, and it didn't need an extended waiting period. Heck, even Hulk vs. Broly was four minutes long, and that had even less time to be polished, and it was even in the same animation style. So why was this the episode that needed the extended waiting period, when you didn't even plan on doing that much with it? Now, to be fair, a lot of what I could bring up for this question does involve me saying, no, this is bad because it's not what I would have done, or something, and while I do accidentally slip into that mindset from time to time, I will say it's not fair criticism. And likewise, I don't think this is a bad episode. It still has good effects, good music, mostly good animations, and there's clearly a love for Dragon Ball, and I can see why Dragon Ball fans are in love with this episode. Even I really like the ending, with Achala head Chala coming in, and Lanny and Michael screaming their lungs out. I'm surprised that they still have vocal cords after this. And the death being the fist bump is a really cool way to end it. That alone makes it better than Deku vs. Asta, if nothing else. And yeah, the conclusion does feel the need to make this matchup sound way more complex than it needed to, but you gotta fill in that time, so I'll get over it. The only downside is that we were robbed of a fusion between Wiz and Boomstick. Come on, I wanna see Wiz Stick! But look, speaking as a resident Dragon Ball hater, I'm actually going to sugarcoat it this time. I mean, yeah, I was bullying Trunks on multiple occasions, but it's not that serious. I just don't care for the characters. It's not that deep. And, and likewise, likewise, for Gogeta versus Vegito, I'm gonna give it a 50 out of 100. I think it would have gotten this score for me even if it was a bonus episode or a normal episode. And I do think in terms of quality, it's a better finale than Thanos versus Darkseid because I actually had a lot of stakes in that episode. And I guess I had some stakes in this one given how long the waiting period was, but at the end of the day, I have no strong feelings for this episode one way or the other. Season 9 of Death Battle was the season that made me want to start this whole ranking retrospective series. So knowing how I would order the series as well as what I liked and disliked about each episode was already fresh in my mind. Yet despite this, I feel like this season had the most amount of surprises despite my opinions on the episode not changing very much. I mean, yeah, episodes like Black Adam vs. Apocalypse and especially Deku vs. Asta aged worse for me, and even SpongeBob vs. Aquaman and Thor vs. Vegeta sort of fell off for me even if I still like those episodes. But on the other hand, episodes like Harley Quinn vs. Jinx, Scarlet Witch vs. Zatanna, James Bond vs. John Wick, and Sauron vs. Lich King had a lot more to love about them than I gave them credit for. And I could just feel the experimentation in almost every episode in some way or form. And that's why it's one of my favorite seasons. While I still adore seasons 5 through 8, I can't bring myself to say that they felt like classic death battle seasons. But with season 9, the type of fight animations we got, the proper crossover vibe, the amount of new series introduced, really made me nostalgic for the old seasons in the best possible way. The second half especially got me the most excited for Death Battle episodes in a while. I'm just gonna say it, I like this more than season 8. Like, as great as that season is, it kinda let me down with its low points and even a couple of its decent episodes. Meanwhile, season 9 doesn't really have that many low points, and even though a lot of this season was just 7 out of 10 land, which I reckon other people believe, once I start breaking down what made this season so consistently good, I gain a much higher respect for this season. And I know for a fact that a lot of other people praise this season for its consistency as well. And with all of that in mind, I'd say that this is easily my third favorite season. Wait, you said you liked it more than season 8. Wouldn't that make it your second favorite season behind season 6? Does he know? Do you know? Well buddy, next time we have much to discuss. Like why have you not subscribed to my channel?